Okay, according to my watch, it is 10 o'clock. Um, we are going to kick off this uh, fourth Q&A uh, webinar that KSB has been hosting since we've all been scrambling to deal with the coronavirus. Um, you'll notice that we are a little bit um, different than we normally are. We're not in our beautiful classroom that I'm so proud of. All of us um, are doing this from home. So you can see these are pictures my kid took for her senior art project at Hastings College. Um, Cody's wallpapered his house and KSB wallpaper. Um, Jordan and Steve both have giant decals and I don't know what Bobby's doing. Um, <clears throat> to kind of uh, make this go more smoothly, I am set up as the host and then I'm gonna unmute each one of the guys as they talk. So I'm actually living uh, you know, my dreams because I have now been able to mute all of the guys and they can only speak when I allow them to do so. Um, if you are uh, managing your um, Zoom, what you're watching, if you don't want to see the gallery view, if you click up uh, at the top of your screen, you can click the button that says active speaker. That would let you see each one of us uh, KSB folks uh, like in a little inset in your uh, screen while we're speaking. Um, and if you don't want to see us, you know, that's fine. We'll get over it. But, um, you know, we're all freshly showered and not looking like we're working from home. So, you know, we're all um, kind of excited to show you that we aren't wearing our jammies today. Um, we do have questions uh, uh, that you can uh, give us in the comment section and I'll be monitoring those questions, except for Bobby's, I'll mute him here in a second. Um, I'll be monitoring those questions as we go. Uh, and the way we've got this set up is we actually did a PowerPoint deck this time um, and each one of us is gonna take a section of the deck. Um, we also, just so you know, the attorneys have a, we've got our Slack open. Um, so if we have, a, we have a back channel to make sure who's gonna handle that question or whatever. So if you see us looking off to the side or down, that's what we're doing. We're not, um, you know, keeping our Snapchat streaks alive, um, <clears throat> even though, you know, we're doing that too. Uh, so let me make sure I'm, uh, if you want a copy of the slides, um, I believe they are up on our, account, on our website now. If they're not, they will be soon. Um, and if you wanna use a QR code uh, to use them, to go get them, you certainly can. My kids make fun of me for my love of QR codes because apparently this is like so old technology mom, it's like five years old, um, but I still use it. Uh, this slide, I just have to tell you that lawyers ruin all the fun. I'm required to tell you that this is not actually legal advice. A lot of you are our clients and some of you are not, which is perfectly cool. Um, if you have specific questions about a specific situation, you should give one of us a call. Rates and terms may vary. Um, so here's our game plan for our time together today. Um, I want to start out by talking for just a second about um, the problem that some of you are facing uh, about um, employee evaluations. I'm moving material on my screen here so I can see. Uh, then we're going to focus the majority of our time on the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Uh, we're going to do an overview and Cody will give us kind of the, the 10,000 foot view of the law. Uh, then we thought really the questions that we're getting and what people um, really want to know is, hey, I have this paraeducator who blah, blah, blah. I have this teacher who blah, blah, blah. So we sat down last night and tried to come up with all the examples of the questions that we're getting. Um, and we have those as examples. Um, and then we're answering how that person would um, be affected by the FICRA, uh, which is what we're calling this act. So each one of us will go through a set of examples. Um, we also have um, some time at the end where we're going to address some of the misconceptions about FICRA because um, I know there's a lot of stuff floating around that's not necessarily accurate or true and so that's um, what we're going to do there. Um, so before we go on past that, um, we're going to hit outstanding questions um, because in addition to the misconception, there's a lot of stuff that we just don't know because the Department of Labor hasn't issued regulations um, and they also, um, you know, are kind of issuing Q and A's overnight. It seems like every night morning I wake up and there's a new set of Q and A's. And then at the end, just like we have for all of these other um, webinars, we'll go through all of your questions in the chat and answer them. So uh, as questions occur to you, stick them in the uh, chat. Uh, Kirk, I see you. Uh, thank you for being grateful that we're allowing you to chat. I also was on the webinar where it was disabled um, and that was irritating to me as well. Um, but so we'll go through all the questions in the chat at the end and we'll answer all of them, <clears throat> but we won't probably answer those questions as we go um, so that we can get through the material. So if somebody has to hop off, they can see the material and then come back on. Uh, last thing, we are recording this and we will post a recording of it 
uh, to the uh, COVID-19 resources part of our website uh, here in just a second. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm supposed to start, I'm gonna start by talking for just two seconds about the problem uh, that some of you are facing uh, because you did not get all of your certificated staff evaluated before school closed. Uh, this is an issue that we saw coming. Don't freak out. You're not alone. You're not going to jail. They're not going to take you to Leavenworth or anything like that. Uh, we at KSB have been working on a form letter that we're going to send out to clients who want it. Uh, and basically the letter says, Dear Mr. or Mrs. Teacher, uh, we didn't get you evaluated because there was a global pandemic. Uh, even though we're not formally evaluating you, here are some thoughts and some suggestions about your performance, and then there's going to be a place for you to fill that in. Um, and then there's a little concluding paragraph that basically says, uh, you're coming back next year, don't worry about it, uh, and I will continue to work with you next year to make you the best teacher you can be. Uh, the reason we think that having something in the file is going to be better than just nothing is for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, uh, Rule 27 requires you to follow all of your statutory obligations as an administrator. So we want something in the file demonstrating that you attempted to fulfill your, your statutory obligations, even though the global pandemic made it impossible for you to do it with complete fidelity. Uh, the second reason we think it's good to have some kind of letter in the employee's file is um, so that two years from now, when we're going to non-renew that probationary teacher who started his first year this year, there's not any question about why there's a missing evaluation. And I think that kind of beats back any argument that this teacher has super tenure. So um, there's nothing magic in what we're putting together. And again, we're going to share it out. We're, I'm, I'm in particular very sensitive to the fact that you guys are on information overload because I kind of feel like I'm on information overload. So we're trying to push things out as you need them instead of doing a huge brain dump all at one time. So we'll probably do a blog post on this issue. And then at that point in time, anybody that wants the forms uh, letters can get them. A couple of you have already asked for those form letters and we will go ahead and send those out today if that's what you want. Um, but so that's, that's kind of the game plan on evaluations. Looking at the guys, so seeing if there's anything else about uh, evaluations that they want me to say. Uh, I don't think so. So the next uh, thing that we're gonna talk about is we're gonna do an overview of FICRA. Uh, and the person that's going to handle that for KSB is Cody. So Cody, give me just a second, I gotta find you now. Um, so we practiced all this stuff. Some of you heard us practicing. The one thing we didn't practice is what happened when other people came on and where all my people went. Um, oh, I just scrolled past. Oren Hill is also on this webinar. Huge shout out to Oren. We're gonna talk about uh, just a couple things about retirement and FICRA at the end of this overview section. And then I will throw it open to Oren to add or rebut anything that I say. Um, so thanks again, Oren, for being such a great partner. Cody, I'm finding you. Cody Kilgore, where's Cody Pruitt? There you are, unmute. All right, Cody, go. Okay, uh, thanks for uh, joining us today. We're gonna talk about some specific examples um, that we think schools face, um, but before we do that, I think it's important to have an understanding kind of of, of what the act says and what it, what it doesn't say. Um, that vocabulary is gonna be important. So this. This Families First Coronavirus Act, or uh, FFCRA, or FICRA, as Karen called it, um, it was enacted just two weeks ago tomorrow, March 18th, and it's in, in effective uh, tomorrow, April 1st. So um, it's been a relatively short time frame from the time it was passed until the time everybody has to be ready to start administering it. Unfortunately, the amount of information that the federal government has trickled out um, is, uh, has been slow. Um, essentially, this act does a lot of things, but for schools, the most important thing is it creates two new categories of employer paid leave uh, related to the COVID-19 disease. The first one is emergency paid sick leave. We'll talk about that in a second. And the second one is emergency family and medical leave. Uh, and we'll talk kind of about the parameters of that. But those are the two types of leave. There's some overlap sometimes, and they are interrelated, but they are uh, referred to differently. So for the emergency paid sick leave, um, there's several grounds that will trigger that leave. And I'm just gonna walk through them all so that you're aware of them and then kind of highlight one thing. So if the employee is subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19, if the employee has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine due to concerns related to COVID-19, 
or if the employee is ex experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and seeking a medical diagnosis. I want to stop right there and just point out that those three categories, I'll call them kind of the employee being sick or the employee being affected, the, the different amounts that employees can receive and caps and things like that are separated for those first three grounds and those last three grounds. So we'll talk about that in a second, but just be aware, those kind of top three, I'll call it self-care or employee being sick, those are sometimes treated differently than the ones uh, four, five, and six. So the next three are, if the employee is caring for an individual who is subject to an order as described in the top two paragraphs, uh, or has been advised as, as said in the second paragraph, then they can get additional leave. This fifth category is the one that's probably we're seeing more in the press, and it's the one that has the most um, overlap with the emergency family and medical leave, and that is if the employee is caring for a son or daughter of that employee, if the school or place of care of the son or daughter has been closed, or if the child care provider uh, of that person is unavailable. Uh, a son or daughter also includes foster child, adopted child, any child standing in local parent, or any uh, parent who stands in local parentis to a child as long as that uh, child is under 18 years of age. And then the last one is if the employee is experiencing any other substantially similar condition specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, in consultation with the Secretary of Treasury and the Secretary of Labor. Uh, I have yet to see anything that has come out where uh, those federal secretaries have designated an additional condition that would trigger this leave. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not coming, I just haven't seen it yet. So, those are the grounds that you can take paid sick leave for. Uh, there are several grounds. They all trigger the same rights, right? And each of those uh, may be handled differently in terms of the caps that are available. Um, if you go to the next slide, so the, 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 the paid sick leave provisions essentially provide two weeks worth of paid leave. So for full-time employees, that's capped out at 80 hours. For part-time employees, um, that is equal to the number of hours that an employee works on average in a two-week period of time. Um, if an employee works more than 40 hours in a week, they can tap into more than 40 hours for that first week. Like let's say an, a full-time employee works 50 hours that week. They can get 50 hours of leave for that first week, but it's all capped at 80. So it might be for 50 hours the first week and 30 hours the second week. Um, and then for employees that have varying schedules, you know, where they work, but it's on and off and you couldn't tell the number of hours that they'd worked on average in a two-week period of time, there's special rules for calculating those depending on if the employee has been employed for six months or not. So if you find yourself in that situation, we can, we can help you figure that out. This next slide we put together to kind of show how uh, the act uh, treats uh, the different reasons for the sick leave differently. So if you're in categories one, two, or three, like I said, if the employee's sick or the employee uh, him or herself is being quarantined, then the amount of sick pay is the greater of either the employee's regular way to pay, the federal minimum wage, or the minimum wage in effect uh, in the state of employment, which is $9 in Nebraska. Um, I don't know that any of you are paying uh, your employees, your classified staff, less than the Nebraska minimum wage, but you could under the law. Uh, generally, uh, public schools are not subject to the Nebraska minimum wage. So if you were paying uh, a classified staff member uh, the federal minimum wage, then they might get a, a bump here in terms of the amount of compensation. And then it, for those categories of leave, the maximum dollar amount that employees can take home is $511 per day and $5,110 total in the aggregate for, for the full two weeks of leave. For uh, categories four, five, and six, it's similar. They, they still look at the amount, the higher, highest of those three factors, you know, either the regular rate of pay or in this case, the minimum wage in Nebraska. But then they reduce the total dollar amount that employees take home down to two thirds of that amount. So uh, if you're paying somebody uh, $9 in Nebraska, you're gonna take uh, that, that rate and uh, come up with it and then multiply it by two thirds to come up with the amount of paid sick leave employees get for categories four, five, and six. Again, that's capped. That's capped at a lower dollar amount. It's $200 per day uh, and $2,000 total. Um, emergency paid sick leave is available all em to all employees regardless of how long the employee has been employed. So if you hire somebody today and they walk into your office tomorrow and say that they wanna take this sick leave, they're entitled to it. It's available for immediate use. Uh, employers cannot require that employees exhaust other paid leave that they have pursuant to their 
negotiated agreement or employment agreement with you or your employee handbook. If they want to come in and take it, they can take it. You cannot require that employee to find a replacement employee to cover for their duties during the time that they're out on emergency sick leave. Uh, and all these leave provisions expire December 31st, 2020. So there's an explicit sunset provision in the act. Uh, obviously that can always be amended, but as of right now, that's when the leave would need to be taken. Okay, that's the emergency paid sick leave. We'll talk about its inter interplay in a second with the other type of leave, but just set that aside and set aside the grounds that you can use that, that leave for a second because now we're gonna move on to a different component of the act for emergency family and medical leave. Okay, this leave can be used when the employee is unable to work or telework due to a need to, for leave to care for the employee's child, if the child's school or daycare has been closed or the provider is unavailable, due to an emergency with respect to COVID-19 declared by a federal, state, or local authority. So that's everything. Okay. Under the emergency paid sick leave, we talked about the six grounds that you can use for it. And sometimes some people are sick and sometimes people are quarantined. None of those grounds are a basis to take emergency family and medical leave. And candidly, the way that the federal government issued the posters, I think is confusing on this issue. So I just want to point it out. There's some overlap when employees are taking paid sick leave for that category five and what would trigger a right to take this emergency family and medical leave. But other than that, those are gonna be separate grounds, okay? Um, this emergency family and medical leave, the way Congress wrote it, is it is part of the Family and Medical Leave Act, the traditional FMLA leave that you're probably familiar with. Um, in the new act, they didn't put any total cap on the emergency family and medical leave. That cap comes from the overall FMLA. So that is a maximum amount of leave is 12 weeks per year. And again, you have options, as you and your bookkeepers probably know, for when you're defining your year for FMLA leave. But that max leave is 12 weeks for all FMLA leave. So if you have uh, an employee that took 12 weeks between, say, November and December of this year, and they're out of their 12 weeks, then even though this new leave created a, a new right to paid leave from the federal government, they may not have any additional leave available under the FMLA. The same thing goes uh, on a going forward basis. If an employee takes FMLA leave now for COVID-19 related reasons, and on September 1st, they have a baby and wanna take their maternity leave, their leave is not gonna be the full 12 weeks, right? Depending on how you calculate it because they may have exhausted their FMLA leave. The first two weeks of this, uh, this leave under the emergency family and medical leave is unpaid. During this period of unpaid emergency leave, the employees can substitute paid leave, right? So that can be accrued PTO, accrued vacation, accrued sick leave, depending on the terms of your employment agreement. If they have paid leave that they can use, they're allowed to use it and have it run concurrently with the first two weeks of the emergency family and medical leave. Um, after that, or excuse me, the other thing that they can do is they can use their two weeks of emergency paid sick leave that we talked about at the beginning, right? Those 80 hours or two, two full weeks of leave they can have that run at the same time as the first two uh, weeks of this uh, emergency family medical leave. Karen, could you advance the slides? Thanks. Um, and then after the first two weeks of unpaid uh, family and medical leave, emergency family medical leave, the next 10 weeks are paid. If you think this sounds weird, you're right. Traditionally, uh, family and medical leave has been unpaid. And when employees receive payment for that, it's because they're using other paid leave pursuant to their employment agreement. That is different here. So this is FMLA leave, but it's different in that it's paid. The amount of pay is at least two thirds of the employee's regular rate of pay, right? And so um, and that's capped at a maximum of $200 per day and $10,000 total. Um, for a lot of employees, that regular rate of pay would be pretty straightforward. Uh, sometimes with varying schedules or varying rate amounts, uh, maybe more difficult. If you have questions about how to calculate that, we're happy to work through that with you. Um, but typically what, what the act provides is that you take the regular rate and you multiply it by the typical hours that an employee would work. If it's full-time, it's typically 40 hours per week. If it's part-time, they look at their average uh, weekly hours during a similar period of time. Um, also, uh, for purposes of this leave and the number of hours worked, you include overtime, you include the base hours worked in overtime, 
but you do not include the premium amount for the overtime hours work. So for example, let's say if someone works 50 hours in a week on average, they get 50 hours of work multiplied by their regular rate, but they don't get time and a half for those 10 hours above the 40 hour base. And again, employees with varying schedules that, uh, that work, workload varies so much week to week that it makes it difficult to anticipate what their average uh, work would have been in a, in a week period of time. They provide uh, a, a formula to, to calculate that. We can help you with that as well. Um, I want to speak for a second about the role of the traditional FMLA in this. Um, I don't want to get into the weeds and over lawyer it, but I would just say that the way the legislation was written, it created some additional provisions, right? Some new texts that go into the law that, that are read alongside uh, the FMLA. It created other things that said, for purposes of taking this emergency leave, we want you to redefine what an employee is, right, for purposes of this leave. So it didn't delete the FMLA provision, it just kind of uh, provided a suggestion about how to interpret it. And then it also left in place a lot of the balance of the FMLA in terms of no retaliation, a right to reinstatements, except for certain uh, exceptions, and then the whole regulatory regime that's out there for the FMLA. And so when you're reading this new act, and, and part of our job is to help, help you navigate, is to figure out what does this speak to, and then what is, is coming down the pike from the federal government, you'll see on the slides, um, there isn't any official regulations yet. That was, that was true as of this morning. Uh, that may not be true as of noon today, so it, it's a moving target, but there is limited federal guidance that's been posted out there online in the form of FAQs and things like that. We'll put a little more meat on the bones as we talk about examples. But the point is that just because something isn't brand new doesn't mean that the old FMLA goes away for purpose of the sleep. We talked about an example earlier. The 12 week cap comes from the old FMLA. That's still in place. This new leave is subject to that 12 week cap. So that's kind of a lot of stuff. I suspect you all have questions about that um, that we'll talk about as we work through examples. Um, but at this time, um, I, I'll turn it back over to Karen. I think she's going to introduce uh, Oren Hill, who's a deputy director and legal counsel for NPERS. Um, yeah, thanks, Cody. And that actually, when you had to goose me to forward the slides, I was messaging Oren. Um, apparently, uh, NPERS is so frugal that their internet connection is not super stable at the, the NPERS office. So Oren can hear us mostly, and he's but he's not sure he'll be able to speak. Um, but he's um, going to PM me if um, if I say anything that makes him crazy. Um, so so the the um, problem with uh, the NPERS uh, regulations is that it's a weird interplay between the IRS and state law. Um, we cannot have tax preferential treatment of our retirement plan in this state unless we follow all the rules of the plan, which in Nebraska are defined as uh, the rules that they've put into the NPERS statutes for school employees retirement. Um, which means even though it might be perfectly sensible to do X, Y, or Z, uh, the NPERS office can't just do that unless the unicameral changes the actual law that governs the, stat, the, the retirement system. So um, when we get frustrated with NPERS not doing this, that, or the other thing that just makes sense for schools, it's really important that we remember that they're, they answer to the IRS, which is the most rigid arm of the federal government. If you think the Office for Special Education is a pain in the butt, um, try working with the IRS for a little. Um, and so Oren is constantly having to, to mitigate between what's in the statutes and what the IRS is going to require. So <clears throat> um, where do we, Cody, did you, did you get the slides I put in about in for, maybe not. Um, so uh, in the definition section of the retirement statutes, um, it says that creditable service is all pay and benefits that an employee gets, and all paid leave for which the employee is paid their regular wages uh, for performing for, for that leave. The problem with this FICRA leave is that people aren't going to get paid their full leave if they only get two thirds of the salary benefit. So what the retirement office is planning on doing with this leave is to have you withhold retirement on the two thirds salary or two thirds wages that you would be paying and then counting that as two thirds creditable service. 
Now, if you're going to allow employees to take additional sick leave or paid leave to top off their leave to get from that two thirds to three thirds, there is no doubt that that will count as creditable service and that you should withhold full retirement on that payment. If uh, the employee doesn't have available sick leave or if your board or your administration decides you're not going to let people top off, uh, then uh, what uh, Orrin is advising is you go ahead and withhold retirement on that two thirds salary, understanding that it is possible that the IRS could eventually say that won't count as creditable service. And if that's the case, we'll have to have the system refund your money, you know, and, and we'll have to square it all up in the end. Uh, but it is wiser, I believe, and Orrin agrees with me, wiser to withhold on all FICRA payments for now because we believe that that's going to be the most advantageous position for your employees and for the retirement system. Oren says that there are gonna be some practical issues on reporting that you're gonna to have to work out. And bookkeepers, I'm sure that um, you, know, you want to know exactly how to fill the forms out. Uh, please understand that you will get some additional guidance from the system uh, and we will be uh, giving you some additional guidance as we can. For now, I think you probably should create a new leave category in your payroll software, that's FICRA uh, payments, and uh, that way you'll be able to go into your um, uh, payment software, your, your wage and hour software, your payroll software, and pull those uh, payments out quickly and see if there's anything different that we need to do. Um, okay, so I'm kind of vamping to see if Oren wants to give me any other guidance. Oren, we could try to unmute you and see if you are able to talk. Um, but uh, let's see. Nope, Oren does not want to be unmuted. Okay. Uh, oh, there you go. Okay. All right, good. I didn't know if people could hear me or not. Um, just so everybody knows, we do know that there may be some practical issues we need to work through as far as reporting the different payroll systems function. Um, so we're looking at that issue, right? The reporting agents that I work with to try and make that happen. Um, to get some feedback from them on our options. The other thing we're waiting on at this point is a chance to talk to NSEA to get their thoughts and feelings on this. Um, I have an appointment scheduled with their government relations specialist this afternoon uh, to put out more guidance. Um, that's really all I wanted to add, Karen, to, to what you had to say. Um, so I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Orrin. And again, um, I just, we all need to take a minute and just be so thankful that we're in this state uh, where we have folks like Orrin from the retirement system that'll hop on uh, with very little notice and be willing to share his expertise. So um, I really appreciate um, the relationship we have with Orrin and um, we'll keep communicating with him and we'll push out the same information that he is able to push out as it becomes available. Uh, Brad <coughs> Hazing, I see you asking if the Department of Labor or NDE will have guidelines for business managers on these types of leave. Um, I don't think NDE will have any guidelines. Um, I think it's gonna be the retirement system and, and perhaps the Department of Labor about um, how to categorize this leave. Um, the other question that is a little bit of an open question right now is whether or not you withhold um, FICA and FUDA with withhold taxes on this leave. And again, when in doubt, always give uncle his share. Uh, and if we're over withholding, he will give us that money back. Um, but I don't want any employee to have to come up with a bunch of money out of their pocket uh, on short notice because we under withheld. So I think you should withhold uh, in, in its entirety, retirement and FICA and FUDA uh, on any of these uh, FICRA payments just to be safe. I think that's gonna be the safest way to handle it. And if we get guidance to the other, uh, to, to the contrary, we'll let you know. Um, okay, so right now you are all probably saying to yourselves, hey, that's all well and good KSB. It's nice that you lawyers can talk about this statute or that statute, but um, how do we actually do this in practice? And so what we've done is we've talked about uh, internally all the questions that we're getting about specific examples. 
And the first question that we think is going to come up is how do you administer these leaves in terms of substitution of paid leave? Um, and so this section is Bobby, and I'm going to mute myself and unmute him. Okay, can you hear me? Awesome. All right, so one quick thing to add on to what Karen said is um, we, we also anticipate to the extent we're talking about withholdings and all of those tax issues, you should be checking with your school's auditor on some of that stuff. KSB doesn't provide tax advice in that regard. We, we ethically can't. Uh, so there will probably be a role for those folks. Um, and I assume like your, your software unlimited and uh, app to fund those sort of people will, will probably have, um, you know, adjustments uh, that, that they'll be making to account for this stuff. But again, we're all kind of in a wait and see approach. Um, so what we've done over the next section here is to basically go through some hypotheticals uh, and hit the, the primary rules that just like for those of you uh, administrators or business officials on the call, when we talk about the Affordable Care Act, uh, Obamacare reporting, we try to hit on the, the most common ones you're going to get, knowing there are always going to be some funky ones. So let's start with uh, this hypo about John Doe, your custodian, and this idea that the, the leaves provided uh, by your work agreement or negotiated agreement with these folks and these two new types of federal law are going to have some overlap, but there are actually decisions you're going to have to make as an employer. So let's assume John is a custodian that's worked for you for 15 years, uh, sort of the, the kind of guy that never misses a day of work. So he's got a lot of uh, paid leave saved up. Karen? Uh, John comes in tomorrow and says, hey, sorry, my wife works at the hospital, was switched to day shifts. I got to stay home with our four kids. Uh, I really can't afford a pay cut. Uh, so I'd like to use some of the leave that I have uh, in addition to that leave uh, that I saw in that new little poster in the break room, since John's the only one that can see that new poster that you will have posted by tomorrow. Let me say that again. You will have posted that poster in your break room and other conspicuous places where you have labor posters by tomorrow. So John sees it, walks into your office, has plenty of sick leave saved up. What options does John have? And so we're going to go through and kind of talk about uh, how these uh, leaves will overlap and, and what I think you can sit down and talk to John about for how he may be able to take this leave. Uh, if you are talking about the substitution or use of paid leave, remember what Cody discussed earlier. And that is that the first two weeks of caregiver leave, because what John is doing is he's taking leave uh, under what, what Cody called subsection five earlier, or the ability to care for a child, uh, a son or daughter under 18, because their school or daycare is closed. So the idea that John says, look, I, I wanna care for my kid, but I can't, I can't get along with only two, two thirds pay. I would like to use a third of my sick leave days for each day and get 100% of my paycheck. Uh, so uh, the first two weeks in that regard are gonna look somewhat different than the last two weeks because of some of the options that John has. So we'll tie all those together at the end. But basically, here's the gist of it. If I'm taking this emergency FMLA leave, so set aside the emergency sick leave for a second. But if I'm taking this emergency FMLA leave, those first two weeks are typically unpaid uh, under, under the FFICRA law. But John can, if he has 30 sick days left, substitute his own sick leave that he has, not using the new paid sick leave under the federal law because he has leave left. So the Q&A makes very clear that John can use his own sick leave during those first two weeks when he's otherwise going to stay home to care for his kids because the school and daycares are closed. John has three basic choices. So this employee that comes in and says, I need to take this type of leave has three basic choices. So choice number one is they could use the combination of the new paid sick leave for the first two weeks and then take 10 more weeks uh, uh, afterwards, but we're talking right now about what John's choices are for the first two weeks, he could use that new paid sick leave, right? Uh, so that's how those two things overlap. Now, unless, and here's the big note if you're, if you're taking notes on this, unless you as the employer have allowed them to supplement, which we'll talk about in our next typo, but if you as the employer have decided that we're only going to allow folks to take the two thirds pay that the statute requires, uh, John's choice, let's assume he didn't have any paid leave left from, from you, the school or the ESU, 
he could use that emergency sick leave for the first two weeks of his emergency FMLA leave for, to care for his kids at two thirds of his rate capped at the $200 a day or 2000 uh, for that two week period. Boop. Over the two week period, remember it's a max of 80 hours. So if John is the sort of person that works typically 50 hours in a week, uh, if he's using the emergency paid sick leave for the first two weeks, uh, then what he gets is basically only uh, a total of 80 hours of pay. So the other choice that John has, if he doesn't want to uh, use the, emergent, the new emergency paid sick leave, is I think John could say, I'm going to take the first two weeks of my emergency family uh, and medical leave unpaid. So he could decide to go unpaid during that time and not use the emergency sick leave if he doesn't have any sick leave or paid leave left from the school. The other thing he could do is use his own accrued sick leave, right? And so that's why these first two weeks look a little bit different uh, because they're otherwise unpaid. So you're, you have three choices. Use the new emergency sick leave and get two thirds of your pay, go without pay, or get 100% of your pay by substituting your own sick leave that the employer has provided to you. Uh, so, so it's, like I said, it's, it's gonna look a little bit different, you know, case by case in terms of how much leave from the, from the school or the ESU that employee has left to use. But that's the idea is John for those first two weeks can use any of, of these options before moving into the next up to 10 weeks uh, where he'd only be able to use the emergency family medical leave to care for his kids. So this, this becomes then the next question. Let's assume that John had enough paid leave left to get his full pay for the first week, even though it would only have been at two thirds pay under the new emergency sick leave. But John decided I'll take 10 of my 30 sick leave days that I have from the school and I'll get full pay for those first two weeks. That's great. But now John has to still get through the next month, right? He's now through the first couple weeks of April, but now he's got to get through the next month or even longer, depending on how long this thing lasts, at only two thirds pay. So a lot of the questions the Department of Labor started to get were basically these. As an employee, can I use the pre-existing leave that I have for my employer to go from two-thirds pay to 100% of my pay under the emergency family and medical leave uh, uh, portion of the new law? And the, I, the Department of Labor, I guess to their credit, now we'll see if the regulations actually bear this out, but the Department of Labor said no. Unless your employee agree or employer agrees to allow you to supplement the leave that you're taking, you can only take, you're only going to get the two-thirds pay. Even if you have 50 sick leave days sitting in your bank at work, right? That because you don't miss a day, then you can accrue up to that many. You still only get two-thirds pay for the remainder of the 10 weeks you're taking to care for your child because of a school or daycare closure, unless the employer allows you to substitute. Again, you cannot simultaneously take both unless they make clear, right, uh, uh, from the employer to the employee, we will allow you to go from two thirds to 100% of your pay. So that's just to, to kind of uh, talk about here at this point, if you're the superintendent sitting listening to this call and you typically set the terms for classified staff, you're gonna have to decide at this point or, and, and or work with your board to make this decision, are we going to let people go up to 100% of our pay? Because if you've got people that are on return to work agreements or that are coming into work right now, they're full time. If you don't allow them to substitute or to, to supplement their uh, emergency family leave at two thirds pay with the sick leave that you provided them, then it's going to look like a worse option to stop working. Now, you, that, that is a decision that you're going to have to make at the local level, and we'll talk more about that later. All right, next one, Karen. So uh, from Q&A number 32, uh, and so if you're somebody who's looked at these Q&As, you may want to reread 31, 32, 33. They answer a lot of these questions about how exactly this supplementing works. Uh, but if you do allow these employees, if you allow John to take two thirds of the pay that you have to give him under the emergency FMLA law, and then take a third of his sick leave days, or a third of a day each day to get up to 100% of his pay while he's out watching his kids, the employee can only do so, it says, up to the employee's normal earnings. So in other words, John can't get 100% pay one day using a sick leave day for you and two thirds through the act. Now, the Q&A doesn't make that exact, but it says multiple times that they can supplement up to the employee's normal earnings. 
Uh, and, and actually, to the extent that it is only up to 100% of their earnings, that would be consistent uh, with the FMLA's rules on supplementing, say, if you're on work comp leave, for example. Uh, so again, they remind you, though, if you want to avoid all of these questions about using leave that you've given them to supplement the emergency family leave, that's a choice you have to make at the outset, right? So you are not required to allow them to do that, at which point it's just for John, for the last 10 weeks of him caring for his kids, two-thirds of his regular pay. Uh, if I'm an employer, can I require the employee to supplement? So I've said, yes, we're going to allow you to supplement, but can I force John to supplement if he doesn't want to? And the answer is no. Uh, they said, basically, how it has to go is, uh, first, the employer has to agree to allow the employee to supplement. Second, the employee must decide, yes, I want to take advantage of that supplementing, and the school cannot force the employee to use one third of a sick leave day for each day that they're on emergency family leave to get up to their 100% pay. You, you can't do it. So it's got to be the employer allows it and the employee asks to do it. Now, this is one of the ones that we'll talk about again later when we get to the sort of return to work agreement. I, I've gotten the question from several of you already uh, privately in the chat. Bobby, we signed return to work agreements and we're paying 100%. We're cool, right? This law doesn't apply. And the short answer is, that's incorrect. We'll talk about why that is when we get down to those examples. But remember, you are entitled to pay more than two-thirds pay. But the choice that you have to make is, how are we going to handle it if we want to do so? Are we just going to allow them to supplement? Or we as the employer, are we going to decide that we're going to pay 100% even when they're on this emergency family leave or emergency sick leave? Because it may be the only thing that you have, if we're being honest about it as the employer, it may be the only thing that you can do to make it look like the, to the employee, whether it's a teacher or a para or a custodian, that it's better to keep working than it is to take this leave, right? That's the only hammer you've got. Because if we're going to pay at 100% or allow them to substitute up, they could get paid 100% by, by continuing to perform under your return to work agreement, or they could get 100% by taking the emergency family and emergency sick leave and not work for you, just like they don't have to if they took a maternity or paternity leave. So that's really the, the crux of the decision making and why I think this initial substitution supplementing question is so important. So we'll go through the next one fairly quickly here. If we can boop. And again, like Karen talked about, keep those emperor's issues in mind. Um, depending on how you supplement or not supplement or how much you pay for, that's going to dictate, right, some of, some of those uh, contribution considerations. Turn it over to... Okay, I muted him because he was uh, done. Uh, the next section we have uh, is talking about intermittent leave, which um, if you have ever had an FMLA issue, uh, a regular FMLA issue, you know, can be a huge pain in the butt. Uh, and Steve Williams is going to talk about intermittent leave. And I think, Steve, you are unmuted. Finally unmuted. I've been warned I'm not allowed to tell any jokes about taking off my pants. Don't forget I can mute you at will. Okay, you're unmuted. A uh, midnight blue silk camisole with spaghetti straps, you will not forget it. I like this section because it's one of the few areas in these stupid new laws that's actually clear as a bell. Um, intermittent leave is not required, period. Pretty freaking easy. Uh, the parties may agree, uh, and uh, it's true for teleworking. It's teleworking. It's true if you're working at, on site at the school. Um, I will warn you, if you read these uh, regulations or these uh, frequently asked question documents, they really try to hide the ball. Uh, that this leave is not required because they keep encouraging you, well, you don't have to do it, but you really should if it's appropriate. And they, they talk about collaborating to achieve flexibility and meet mutual needs. And so, uh, although it's very clear you don't have to do it, they strongly encourage you throughout the, the documents to, it, you know, if it fits your situation and it's, it's not putting you out, then you probably should do it. So that's, that's what they tell you on intermittent leave. So we, we've got a couple of hype that should be pretty straightforward. Uh, your custodian's working at the school. His eight-year-old kid, uh, his school is closed due to the virus. The employee asks for intermittent expanded family and medical leave back from 12 to 2 because he wants to go home and give his spouse a break. Apparently, he likes his wife. 
Are you required to grant the intermittent leave? Easy answer, no, uh, you don't have to, but again, they encourage you to collaborate to achieve flexibility and meet mutual needs. So that's under the expanded uh, FMLA. Uh, if you go under the intermittent paid sick leave, similar thing, your bookkeeper's teleworking. Uh, her 10 year old's uh, daycare is closed due to the virus. The employee asks for intermittent paid sick leave. Uh, and basically she wants to take Monday, Wednesday, Friday off, but telework on Tuesday and Thursday. Are you required to grant the request? Easy answer, no. But again, they want you to collaborate to achieve maximum flexibility. So uh, intermittent leave is easy. You don't have to do it, but if it fits for you, they, they strongly encourage you to do it. So intermittent leave, pretty straightforward. Okay, that is intermittent leave. I will re-mute Steve uh, and unmute Cody because he's gonna do this ability to work or telework hypo. Yeah, so one of the things we as lawyers, when we see things like somebody being quote, unable to work or telework is what does that unable to work mean? So we're gonna talk about the guidance that we've received and what documentation uh, we think you can ask for. So here's an example, Mark's a high school history teacher. Uh, his school's been closed since March 18th due to COVID-19. And during this whole time, he's been working remotely from home during school hours, providing online history lectures uh, live to students. But just recently, uh, the daycare where his uh, four and two-year-old boys attend uh, was closed as a result of COVID-19. Uh, Mark's spouse works outside the home and her place of employment's not closed. She's still going in every day. Uh, if Mark comes into the district office, and asks about leave under the FFCRA, what do you tell him? Is there grounds for the leave? Uh, hopefully after what we've talked about so far, uh, your inclination is to say probably. Um, so it depends though on, is he unable to work uh, or telework for COVID-19 related reasons? What does that mean? This is the way the federal government answers these types of questions. You're unable to work if your employers work for you. And one of the COVID-19 qualifying reasons set forth in the FFCRA prevents you from being able to perform that work either under normal circumstances at your normal work site or by means of telework. Clear as day, right? No, that's not very helpful. It's circular. They say you're unable to work when you're unable to work. Okay. So what can you require as proof of documentation, right? Do you have to have proof that Mark's wife is not working from home? Um, can you require an affidavit from Mark certifying that he's the only responsible adult that can care for his children during the workday? Um, do you have to have him generate evidence in swarm statements from the daycare provider that if left unsupervised, Mark's children will turn into gremlins? No, none of this. Even if we wanted to have an iron fist and be super demanding and aggressive from an employer standpoint, this is not the type of documentation that the federal government is contemplating. Um, instead, documenting an inability uh, to work or telework, it's a relatively low threshold for employees to meet. Um, the government even suggested in its uh, FAQs that for leave taken to care for a child whose school or daycare is closed, uh, the documentation may, documentation may include things like a notice of closure or, or unavailability from your child's school or daycare, it includes things like notices that may have been posted on a government school or daycare website, published in a newspaper, emailed to the employee uh, from an official school or daycare. So the, the type of proof that it's asking for here it gives these examples of the type of documentation to show an inability, but reading between the lines, what it, what it implies, at least to us so far, is that if the parent can show that their kids are home because their school is closed, they're pretty close to being able to demonstrate that, at least under the federal guidance, that they're unable to work or telework, okay? So it's a pretty low showing right now, okay? And we don't think that you're going to be able to, to want to get into a fight about whether their kids being home really makes them unable to work. But um, I think it's important to offer uh, flexibility. And the, the federal guidance even addresses this situation. It says that if the employee and the employer agree that the employee will work their normal hours to perform their duties, but will be outside of the normal work schedule, such as early in the morning, late at night, then the employee is able to work and leave is not necessary. So there's a couple of things here that I think are important. You're not obligated to provide that flexibility. But if you and your employee come to an agreement that they could get their duties done with that flexibility, then by definition under the federal guidance, they're not entitled to the FFCRA leave, okay? So what does that look like for Mark, right? He's the history teacher that's trying to provide uh, online uh, enrichment. You could offer a little allow Mark to record and edit his lectures early in the morning or late at night. You could put a time delay on him to make sure it's not live. 
Um, you could switch any type of live communication with students and parents to the evening time after Mark's wife returns home and parents are maybe available at the end of their work day. If Mark agrees that he can perform his duties with this flexible schedule, then Mark is not, quote, unable, end quote, to telework, and FFCRA leave is inappropriate. So here, here's our advice in terms of this issue. I would strongly recommend you be proactive and take the initiative in offering flexibility. I think this federal leave issue and the guidance uh, supports that position. I also think, frankly, it'll be uh, appreciated by your employees that are trying to juggle being home with kids while also doing a good job to help their students uh, to the best of their ability. I think you taking the lead, you don't have to say this is for FFCRA lead purposes. You can say, hey, I know you got a lot on your hands. We want you to remain engaged. What can we do from our standpoint to offer you the flexibility to do it? If you're comfortable with that, offer it and listen to what the employee says in terms of what would help them. Um, and then, and then once you do that, document their representations in their agreement. If you've reached out and said, hey, I know this is a large workload. How have the last five days gone? What would be better? And if they said, man, if I could just get out of the conference calls from noon till four every day, I could do everything else, then document that and say, great, you're doing it. Here's the documentation and move forward. And then I'm not saying that you want to lay the groundwork to fight with them on the leave if they come in a week or 10 days, but then you've at least created favorable evidence for the school to be able to say, no, 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 you agreed that we, you could be flexible and get your job done. You're not really unable to work because nothing about your situation uh, with your children being home or our expectations have changed. So I think that's the best thing is to, to be proactive and to offer as much flexibility as is feasible for you to carry out the goals of the district. And I think it'll help you both from an employee expectation standpoint and from a, a federal leave standpoint. Okay, thanks, Cody. That. Um... I, I think makes a lot of sense. And the first thing I went to when I read the Q and A was, what does it mean unable to telework? Um, and I think the the lesson from Cody and from the regs is it's kind of dependent on everybody's individual situation. Uh, next question that we've been getting from folks is, what about those of us that just sent our paras and custodians home when school closed and we told them, stay home, we're not paying you, you can come back to work when school reopens. How does the FICRA uh, affect them? And that's, uh, Steve's gonna handle this section. And there's basically three potential situations you're dealing with. One is if you close before April 1st. So if you close before April 1st, you sent everybody home and you stopped paying them because you didn't have any work for them to do, they are not eligible for this paid sick leave or this expanded FMLA leave. Uh, they may be eligible for unemployment, but they're not getting that, that fancy paid leave. Uh, and this is true whether you close due to lack of business or any of the directives from any of those uh, state, federal, or local agencies. Now, what if you closed on or after April 1st? So basically starting uh, tomorrow and after. Uh, if you close uh, on or after April 1st, but before the employee goes on leave, again, they are not eligible for that new uh, paid sick leave or the, the expanded Family Medical Leave Act. And again, that's true even if the leave was requested before tomorrow. So if they've already requested the leave uh, to start after, it, they're not going to be eligible. Again, they might be eligible for unemployment, assuming they meet all the other requirements. And the reason for your closure is irrelevant to whether they qualify or not. Uh, the final one is what if you close during the, the paid sick leave or the expanded family medical leave? Um, and so before the closure, uh, the school's going to have to pay for it. Uh, but after you close, they're, again, they're not, not eligible. You're not open. Uh, there is no sick leave, there is no expanded family medical leave act. And again, once after the closure, they may again be eligible for unemployment if they meet all of the other requirements. So those are the three different situations you're looking at. Again, that's pretty straightforward uh, and, and doesn't seem to cause too much confusion. Yeah, what Steve said there is 100% correct. I just wanted to tag on to one thing um, and it may be us try being cautious, but the guidance that the federal government put out that says these things really doesn't appear in the text of the law. And so I would say if you are going to take a really strict position and categorically exclude somebody from eligibility for this leave based on the fact that the school's closed and you don't have any work and you're not paying them. I mean, if all those criteria are met, I think you have support in what the website says right now, but I would recommend calling your school attorney before taking too aggressive a stance with this because it, it, it's not supported by the law. The regulations may flesh that out, um, but I, I think you want to think through, have you really sent them home? Are they really kind of in a laid off furloughed situation? Are you not paying them a dime? What about your contribution towards their benefits? 
you want to think through those things before you just take the position that they're not eligible for this league. I, I agree with that, Cody. I also think that um, the federal government is trying to make sure that the widget factory that had to close, that they're not double tagging that employer. So I, I do think in the end, if you've sent them home and you truly aren't paying them anything, they aren't going to be eligible for sick for leave. Um, but Cody is absolutely right. The, the regs are, you know, who knows what they're actually going to say. Um, but uh, all the stuff that Steve, those of you that sent folks home, you're going to want to go through Steve's slides because that's going to be the, the default answer right now. Um, next question that we're getting is what about teachers? Um, we get a, a lot of administrators, this whole concept makes sense in terms of classified and custodial or any staff that's unable to work or, or isn't guaranteed of getting paid. But what I'm getting from administrators is, um, what about teachers? Uh, what about Tommy teacher who's outraged that the superintendent expects him to actually provide enrichment to students? And this school uh, is asking the teacher to Zoom with kids twice a week and the teacher just thinks that's the most ridiculous thing ever. Uh, on April 1st, so tomorrow, Tommy comes in and says, my kids are home now that school's closed. So I can't work or telework. I would like my FIFIC relief. Uh, what do we have to do for that teacher? Um, we all know, uh, because the union has pointed it out to us repeatedly, that uh, after the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, this statute was put into the Nebraska Revised Statutes. Uh, 79.8,106 says, in case of epidemic sickness prevailing to such an extent that the schools uh, in any school districts are closed, teachers shall be paid their usual salaries in full for such time as the school is closed. So this answers the question about whether or not Tommy gets paid his full salary, even though he's just zooming in twice a week. The question that the FICRA poses is, can Tommy opt to do nothing and still uh, take the FICRA leave and get his full pay under 79.8,106? Uh, I've had this question from probably 10 different superintendents in the last week. Uh, somehow there was a misperception out there that teachers could get two thirds of a thick relief pay and get their full salary. Uh, teachers, even the NSEA is not that good of a lobbyist, right? There is no way that your teachers are gonna get paid one and two thirds times their salary for the period that the school district is closed. So uh, teachers can either opt to continue receiving their full salary under 79.8,106, or they cannot for FIFIC relief, which we're going to talk about here in a second, but they don't get both and. Um, so don't be, don't be fussing that you're going to have to double pay your teachers. Um, and this is made explicit in the Q&A. Bobby already touched some of these Q&As when he was talking about the custodian, John. Uh, but Q&A number 31 says, if you are eligible to take leave under FIFICRA, as well as take paid leave that is already provided by your employer, Unless your employer agrees, you must choose one type of leave to take. You may not simultaneously take both. So this is in the black and white in the federal regs that tells us that Tommy Teacher can't take both his 79.8,106 pay and an extra two thirds of the FICRA pay. Um, so there's that again. Um, so I went ahead and underlined here, you may not simultaneously take both just because I know it's nice to have this stuff handy when someone rolls into your office um, thinking that they're gonna to, to tell you what, how you're gonna have to apply the law. Um, so the question then becomes, Tommy doesn't care if he's only, uh, if he gets paid pandemic leave, he's saying, I don't wanna do these lessons, I don't wanna zoom into my kids. Uh, under the federal law, Tommy is only eligible for FICR leave if he is unable to telework. And as Cody mentioned earlier, the Department of Labor seems to think that this is a joint decision between employer and employee. Uh, uh, question and answer number 18 says, if you and your employer agree, blah, 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 blah. So uh, it seems to me that the most conservative reading of these Q&As is that if Tommy is insistent that he is unable to telework, it's gonna be a really hard battle for us to fight to prove that no, you would be able to telework if you just put those little uh, kids to bed at eight o'clock, you'd have from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. To, to do this work. I, I just don't think that the regs are going to support us uh, when they come out in insisting that Tommy teleworks if he says he can't because his kids are out of control. And again, uh, emphasizing here on the slide, it says if you agree and your employer agrees, 
Um, so that's my basis for thinking that we can't force Tommy to telework. Uh, so let's say Tommy uh, does uh, establish in your mind that his kids are just little hellions. You know that because they go to your school. There is no way that he's going to be able to uh, Zoom to these families while he's home with his kids. Uh, Tommy may qualify for FIC, FIC relief, but notice again that he does not automatically get to top off the difference between the two thirds pay uh, and his pay under the pandemic leave provision. Uh, the Q&A makes clear that topping off or supplementing your pay is prohibited unless both sides agree. That's the Q&A 31 through 33 that Bobby referenced before. Again, you probably as a superintendent or a bookkeeper want to have those three Q&As printed and handy when people come in with questions. Um, and the question for me, even if we wanted to allow Tommy Teacher to top off, it's not clear to me how we would do that. What would we be topping off with? Are we topping off with his 798106 leave? Because there's nothing in the statute that really allows us to slice and dice the teacher's full salary into something less than quote unquote full salary. Would we be topping off with some sort of paid time off? Uh, has Tommy met the requirements of PTO? Uh, most of you have, uh, it, the, most of you that have PTO are using it to um, supplement your sick leave provisions. Um, and so usually there are some requirements for people to, to hit some kind of qualification before they use PTO. Uh, are you topping off with sick leave? And if you are, would you be topping off with the regular sick leave that your employees get? Or is it uh, the amended provision of sick leave that a lot of you adopted in amending your negotiated agreements with your local associations? Um, all of these questions are why I think it's going to be generally a bad idea for us to allow teachers to top off. I think we should tell teachers that they can take their full salary under 798106 and along with that involves doing the enrichment or instruction or educational activities that the school district is requiring, or they can do nothing and get their two thirds pay um, for the 12 week period. Uh, but I don't think we should be fiddling with top off agreeing. And now if you're in a unique situation and you wanna call one of us and we work something out, absolutely you can. But I'm thinking if you're gonna top off, you may have to go through your local teachers association because this could be an unfair labor practice um, in just unilaterally deciding how you're gonna to top off someone's um, uh, PFIC leave. So Tommy likely qualifies for two weeks of emergency paid sick leave. That's gonna be at two thirds his regular rate capped at $200 a day or $2,000 total. Uh, he also probably qualifies for 10 weeks of emergency family medical leave act. Again, he's only gonna get two thirds of his regular rate capped at $10,000 total for those 10 weeks. <clears throat> now, if Tommy does opt to take his FMLA leave, uh, that will be reduced by any FMLA leave that he had taken in the prior 12 months. You see the asterisk there on that slide. Uh, you're gonna have to check your school board policies on how you determine the FMLA eligibility period. Most of you have a rolling 12 month period, which means that any FMLA leave that Tommy has taken in the previous 12 months will reduce his eligibility for emergency FMLA. A few of you still have school year FMLA periods, and so then it would just be the time that Tommy has taken during the 1920 school year. Either way, if you've got somebody who's been on FMLA who is now asking to take emergency FMLA, you need to go hunt down how much time that person has taken and when your eligibility period runs. Now, the good news is, um, even though I'm assuming the administration is gonna be annoyed with Tommy that he wants to get um, his two thirds pay and doesn't wanna do the instructional work, uh, the upside is that that will also exhaust Tommy's ability to take FMLA leave moving forward for the next 12 months. And again, that asterisk means it depends on how your school district has defined your FMLA period. Most of you have a rolling 12 months. A few of you might, again, be limited to the school year. So this is the scenario that if a teacher says, I don't want to do the enrichment or the education, I want my FMLA leave. The answer is yes, they probably get it if they have kids at home. Um, but they're only going to get two thirds of their pay and they're not automatically entitled to top off. Um, I got to look now. Sorry, I got excited because I was talking and I got to look to see who has the next section, which means I need to open my phone. Come here. Uh, Karen. Oh, Nick says, Bobby, the interplay between a return to work agreement and uh, a FICRA. So unmute Bobby. 
Okay, so this is exactly what Karen just talked about. This idea between if they're going to take leave, the reason that an employee might take leave even if you're paying them is because they don't want to or are unable to work, right? So Bobby, we pay them at 100%. Wouldn't they be crazy to come in and take this leave if we've already signed a return to work agreement with them? If the answer is maybe not if their reason for coming in to ask for this leave is because they're unable to report to work if you ask them to. So let's talk about Pam. Uh, and Pam is a paraprofessional, your best one, who came in on day one of the closure and said, you know what? Uh, I'm willing to do whatever I can to help the school. I know this is going to be tough. Boss, you just tell me what I can do to help uh, and I'll do it. So Pam signs a return to work agreement. Uh, there are a lot of versions of agreements and resolutions floating out there. The one that we provided to our clients says that if we're going to pay you during this time, times that you're working or not working, you're going to give us as the school some promises. Promise number one is you're going to take whatever assignments that we have for you. Promise number two is that you're not going to leave. Uh, you're going to remain ready to work when we need you to. So if there's you know, a week in the next month where paras, where you really only have, you know, stuff for them to do on one day, we'll give them the full pay uh, that, that our board elected or that the administration elected to give them under the return to work agreement. But part of the promise is that they sit, they are ready to work for you if and when you need them. So if your kitchen staff is still putting together lunches, right, uh, to deliver pursuant to your meal programs that you're running through the closure, and two of them come down with the coronavirus, the purpose of the return to work agreement is for you to call Pam and another para and have them come in and do some of that work, right? So that's the, the benefit that the employee is getting is they get paid under the return to work agreement, but the, what they're giving up is having to work for you when you ask them to. So Pam has done everything you've asked, right? She's painted, delivered meals, made copies of enrichment packets for teachers, but then she comes in because of a change in her personal circumstances. On April 10th, uh, she says her six-year-old is now presumed positive, so forced into quarantine. Pam's mom is the one who had been watching her son while Pam was working for you, but mom is 64 and diabetic, and so mom's doctor has said that, uh, so, so first and foremost, Pam is not gonna have really any way to prove, right, that her son has coronavirus, because with the lack of testing, she's just been told by her doctor, just keep him home for two weeks. Uh, and now Pam's mom has gone in because of this to see her doctor. And Pam's mom has been told uh, by doc, sorry, grandma, you can't watch uh, your grandson anymore. And in fact, you're at such high risk, you should probably be isolating and only leave your house, you know, for the next several weeks uh, out of a if you have a medical emergency. So in other words, this has nothing to do with Pam's willingness to work and everything to do with the change in Pam's circumstances. So the idea that we've uh, had an employee that has signed a return to work agreement, uh, that they somehow don't want to come work for us, right? That is different than Pam, uh, who has signed a return to work agreement and agreed to be available. So that's one of the key provisions here. Now I see some questions trickling in about what if we offered this to an employee and they decided not to sign it? Well, my assumption is that that employee is probably taking unemployment that you're not expecting them to work, and so they're not eligible for any of this fulficrally. That's the truth, right? They're also not getting their retirement benefits on that unemployment piece, and so there's a give and take here, right? These things work together. But for somebody like Pam or any other classified staff member that signed one of these agreements, one of the requirements is that they agree to be available to work. So when Pam comes in and tells you that I am unable to work due to my son's getting coronavirus probably, and my mom being unable to watch him anymore, what Pam is saying is, I can't comply with the terms of my return to work agreement. Now, that's not her fault. She's not a bad person. She's not somebody who's just looking to not uh, do work for you, but her circumstances have changed. And so now Pam is not technically entitled to the pay and benefits continuation that you've agreed to under the return to work agreement because she can't hold up her end of the deal. That's where Fafikra comes in, right? This is the situation where it's not just bad faith like Tommy Teacher who didn't want to work. This is Pam who's perfectly able to work but has decided she can't because of a change in her circumstances. You can keep clicking, Karen. Uh, so one of the things that some schools may agree to do is to keep paying Pam even though she can't come into work. That is a riskier option, right? Pam will still get whatever you promised her, uh, but 
the, the benefit of having somebody on a return to work agreement is you retain their promise to, to come work for you when school reopens. So we'll talk about the options here in a second. But the answer is if Pam comes in and lays this story in front of you, you don't have to say, oh, you breached the agreement. Sorry, you're on your own. Uh, the, the other thing to keep in mind is that your return to work agreements, if you've signed them or if you passed a resolution, your board probably only authorized payment through the end of this current school year. And if you're a nine month person, the paid sick and paid FMLA leave would extend uh, well into next school year too, assuming you only have six or seven weeks left of, of this school year. Uh, so the return to work agreement section six also has an important provision in there because like Cody mentioned earlier, uh, the FMLA is still in place, and especially this uh, emergency family leave is part of the FMLA. The return to work agreement says that if the employee is eligible for any other state or federal leave under the law, excuse me, under the law, uh, they are required to comply with the district's policy and with the state or federal law for taking that leave. So here's the question. If Pam comes in, or if, let's say you've got a pair that just says, eh, I don't want to work, I'm just going to take uh, my 100% pay under the return to work agreement. You can absolutely tell them if you're telling me you're not willing to work, then you're not going to get paid under the return to work agreement, right? So if that employee comes in and says, hey, yeah, I, I'm just going to decide to stay home now, you have a choice to make, right? And we'll talk about this here in a second, but you could tell them if you're not willing to work, you're not going to get anything, but you could also probably designate their leave under this uh, FIGRA if they've come in and told you, I don't plan on, on working for you on a move forward basis. So the idea of having a return to work agreement, in our opinion, actually gives you more options for how to address these situations. Uh, and FAFICRA is a supplement to that and not a replacement for it. So here's our suggestion. If you have somebody like Pam, meet with her, talk through her options, right? Including how taking one option over another is going to have an impact on how much pay she gets, what benefits she gets, and things like ENFER's retirement contribution uh, considerations. So options that I think you have to address uh, Pam's request to say, hey, I've got to stay home with my kiddo because my only childcare is, is now uh, unavailable and the school's closed. You could say to Pam, do you want to take this new uh, leave under FAFICRA, right? Which could be emergency sick leave and it could be emergency FMLA leave, which will entitle her though to only two thirds of her pay even if she signed a return to work agreement. Because the provision of the return to work agreement says if you're taking leave while you're under this return to work agreement under a state or federal law, you gotta comply with that law. So that means that Pam is only, even if she signed a return to work agreement, entitled to two thirds of her pay. So talking through with Pam that that is one of the realities here is gonna be important. And then going all the way back to the beginning of the Q&A, would you allow Pam to supplement that two thirds pay using her own paid leave? Karen talked about for teachers, why that's kind of complicated. It may, you may have a different feeling for your classified staff members. And one of the things we simply don't know is if the Department of Labor is gonna allow you to make different choices based on different categories of employees. So the other thing that Pam could do is she could say, look, I don't wanna take an emergency family leave and maybe you've decided not to designate that leave. Pam could take existing paid leave. So if, Sam, or if Pam has 30 days of sick leave saved up somehow, she may be able to run out the rest of the school year, assuming you're going to allow her to take sick leave to care for her sick child, but also just to be home with her sick child if she doesn't have daycare. Most schools don't allow teachers or anybody else to use sick leave simply to provide childcare if the kid's not actually sick. Uh, the other thing you could do is you could say to Pam, okay, you're, you're telling me you can't work. It's a sad set of circumstances, but we're not going to pay you under the return to work agreement anymore. So your choice may be to take unemployment, right? Because Pam's told us she's, she's not able to work for us. Uh, and yeah, there's a lot of buzz going around about, um, well, under the, new, under the state law and under the new federal law and under these payments that are just gonna be paid to every American that makes less than a hundred grand, isn't Pam gonna make more taking unemployment? <laughs> and the answer may very well be possibly so, right? But Pam probably needs to at least understand the impact that that could have on Pam's retirement and benefits through the school. Because if somebody goes on unemployment, you're not obligated to continue their benefits. I saw that question come in earlier. If they're not working for you and you haven't agreed to continue their benefits or use a return to work agreement to do so, they're not entitled to their pay or their benefits, right? So going on unemployment may have the, the consequence of they now need to cut you a check 
from their unemployment benefits for the health insurance if they want to continue that through you. The other thing you could do is you could say, listen, Bobby, we, you don't understand. If we lose Pam, we're screwed. We cannot lose Pam. Therefore, uh, you could continue to pay Pam under your return to work agreement. It is a bit riskier option because Pam has come in and told you, I can't satisfy my obligations under the agreement because I can't come into work. So the bottom line here is if Pam comes in and all this is confusing as hell to you, you should call your school lawyer and talk through the options that you have. Uh, because how all this lays together, return to work agreements, unemployment, FICRA, uh, is fairly complicated. And depending on which decision you make, it's going to have trickle down consequences for things like retirement continuation of benefits. Um, thanks, Bobby. The one thing I would also add is um, Bobby's absolutely right. The, the whole interplay of unemployment, return to work, uh, FICRA is super complicated. And then you add in the additional unknown about uh, possible uh, funding for schools under the CARES Act, which has just passed and is 880 pages of uh, impenetrable legal stuff. Um, you're just going to have to make decisions with imperfect information doing the best you can. Um, okay, next section that we have is just some common misconceptions, and this is Cody. Yeah, so um, there's a lot of misconceptions out there, and the government's not helping. Um, I think one of the biggest things is the, the misconception of the payroll tax credit. Um, Karen, could you? Uh, oh, sorry. Thanks. So um, there's statements out there like employers will receive 100% of reimbursement for paid leave pursuant to the act. Uh, there'll be an, an immediate dollar for dollar tax offset against payroll. Unfortunately, those quotes that you see up there are in quotes because those come from press releases from the Department of Treasury, right? And so it's easy when the when it only passed less than two weeks ago and you see those things and think, oh, we're going to be receive funding for that. But the short answer is that that's not true for public schools, ESUs, or public or other political subdivisions. The text of the legislation itself makes clear that it shall not apply to the government of the United States or the government of any state or critically for schools and ESUs any political subdivision of the state, right? So um, you're not gonna have funding out there uh, that you're gonna get in the form of payroll tax credits. There have been representations, like there's a ton of federal money coming down the pike. It's not in here, but it's gonna come through the CARES Act. If you pay this funding, schools will get funding from other sources. It's gonna pass through NDE, right? I'm not, those things may happen, but they're yet to be seen in terms of the specific dollars flowing into the district to fund the leave that you're going to start paying and incurring uh, as early as tomorrow morning. Oh, is this not you, Cody? I'll do no. it. I, I'll always talk. Um, like I said, uh, right at the beginning of the misconception. So we have gotten the question that, that Cody addressed um, several times, this question of uh, what about, don't, don't we want to force our employees onto the FIFIC relief because it'll be more advantageous to us because we'll get the tax break. Um, <clears throat> the FIFICRA tax credits are not available to government uh, sub political subdivisions. We don't know what additional reimbursement will be available under the CARES Act. Um, we have been in communication with the Department of Ed um, and uh, uh, they seem to be somewhat optimistic that there will be some dollars. I think all of those dollars are going to flow from the feds to the state, to the State Department of Ed and from there to us. So individual local education uh, entities may or may not be equally benefited by the CARES Act. We just don't know. Um, and we don't know uh, how they're gonna reimburse us for keeping people employed. Uh, the other thing that we wanted to point out um, is uh, there are some districts that uh, early on in all this just passed a resolution saying pay them uh, during any kind of COVID-19 closure. Uh, we are afraid that this, um, this provision would be basically like the teacher uh, ability to be paid during a pandemic closure, that it's extra pay paid leave, and that at this point, you wouldn't be able to force them to substitute their FICRA paid leave for that just sort of blanket paid leave. Um, I think there will also be some weird FICRA issues for those of you that uh, passed a pay them now and make them work later resolution, um, which we had some concerns about the state constitutional issues presented by that. But I'm afraid that um, if you passed a pay now, work later uh, provision, they can get paid now. And then when you need them to work later, they're gonna take their perfect relief, if that makes sense. So it, it, I, I 
cannot quote, because um, I told him I wouldn't, I cannot quote the conversation that I had with the NSEA's attorney yesterday, um, but all of the attorneys that are touching this agree that this is not gonna be a one size fits all answer for anyone. This is gonna really depend on what each local board of education decided to do with its staff, uh, including teachers and classified staff, and then the individual circumstances of that classified staff member. Um, okay, I'm gonna unmute Bobby, unmute, unmute Steve. This is highly uh, dangerous. Unmute Cody. Um, before we get to the questions, guys, is there anything else that you wanna tag on just based on what we've said so far? We, we, I think we should hit the forms now in case some people have oh, to yeah. jump off real quick, Karen, just because we, we've gotten the question. Here's the truth, everyone. <laughs> Every school lawyer, if you go out there and Google around for FAFICRA employee leave application, you're going to find nearly nothing because every employment lawyer, every person who represents employers generally, including us that represent schools, I talked with Justin Knight about it yesterday from the Perry firm with some administrators. We don't know what the Department of Labor is going to do. So I guess what we're kind of asking is we're, what we're doing is riding out the clock as long as we can until we figure out if the Department of Labor is going to have forms for us to use or not. Sometimes they mandate that those forms are used uh, for various purposes. Uh, but if we don't have anything from the Department of Labor, um, we will have something out to KSB clients, anybody who wants it, uh, to use when people inevitably walk into your office tomorrow to request this either of these types of leave. What we can't do, and I've seen, you know, I, I saw Brent and some others ask for a one-page cheat sheet. We can do our best to, to give you guidance in as concise of a format as possible. But if your mind is telling you, I want a one-page cheat sheet on this, you need to reconceptualize the intricacy and, and complication of this law. I don't, I'm not trying to be a jerk, Brent. What I'm telling you is, this is a lot more complicated than something you're going to, if we could give you something you could refer to in a page, we wouldn't be on this webinar. So the, the truth of the matter is, <laughs> yeah, you are, Brent. Okay. <laughs> the truth of the matter is we will have forms for you to use, but there, to the extent that we can, we'll help put information into those forms, which clarifies the type of lead. You know what I mean? Like the, the, those sorts of things that we hit on at the beginning, but our form isn't going to be the magic bullet for this either, uh, nor is any, you know, one page document. Uh, that we could try to put together. Now we'll do whatever, you know that we'll do whatever we can to help you and we'll be as concise as possible. But the truth is we'll have something for you to use. It's not gonna be a panacea. It's not gonna be the, sort of the end all because this is just straight up complicated stuff that they foisted on us in the middle of a crisis when they're supposed to give us regulations that haven't been released as of 11-22, the day before this law goes into effect. But the, the one thing I would say to, to, uh, to Brent's question and Sam Stecker, I saw you too, Yes, we can absolutely provide you a pared down summary of these high points. You know, what are the criteria? What are the pay limits? All that. We'll definitely get that to you so you have it as a running start. What we can't do is anticipate all the complicated issues, substitution, intermittent, you know, return to work, teacher. We won't be able to write everything on one page, but the short answer is we'll absolutely get you something that'll give you a running start on the broad framework of the law. So just let us know. And that's Brent said, Cody, that, yeah, that's what he's trying to say. Absolutely. Well, and we'll, we'll, we're, we have been in process on something like that. Again, we're hoping to see these regulations to the extent that they talk about uh, some more of the, the issues we've hit on today. So, yeah. So the, the bottom line is um, if they don't release forms today, uh, we five, I'm going to include Jordan on this because Jordan usually gets the short end of the stick. Um, we five will somehow before tomorrow, the sun comes up tomorrow morning, have a KSB form that you can use. It would be way better for the government form to be the common form that everybody uses so that you don't have like four or five different forms that you're juggling around with. Um, but if, if they don't have a form out by tomorrow and people can start asking for the sleeve, we will have something that we will push out to people that want it. And we'll probably maybe push out a blog post with our, I don't know, we're, we have to talk about, we, th we, we also kind of thought we had done a, a pithy summary. So, you know, the fact that you guys think we talk too much is just, you know, insulting to us. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna scroll back up to the top of the comments um, and we're just gonna start marching through these comments and um, we're gonna answer um, each of these as we go. And guys, just so that we're not talking on top of each other, um, give me a wave if you really want the question or I'll just throw it to somebody and 
then if you want to throw something in, you can so that we're not interrupting anybody. Um, so uh, Greg Appleby asked about Section 125 and daycare, asked if we can use a change of status form to stop taking withdrawals for employees that are uh, no longer have daycare. Um, and I researched this for somebody, and I uh, don't know if Sherry got, I, I have an actual citation, legal citation I can give you. But the short answer is yes. You have a change in circumstances. You can no long, You can uh, change the withholding to the TPA for your child care credit. Cody, I was just going to say that's the employee's option, right? So um, typically, employees are capped at five thousand dollars per year for child care expenses, which they very well could have incurred already or will incur in the fall. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't assume they want to change those. But if they want, if they choose to change those, you have the ability to do that. Yeah. Normally, you're stuck for the plan year. But a change in circumstances like your daycare closing does allow you to change the withholdings. And Greg, if, if so talk to your TPA and if you want the citation, I've got it. I just don't have it at my fingertips right now. Um, I know, Sadie, you're my favorite. That's why muting Bobby is, I'm just living my dream. Brad, we're not gonna talk about Steve's jammies because you know there's dangerous stuff that even I won't talk about. Uh, John Cerny, can we evaluate a teacher now by observing a Zoom lesson? Uh, any of you three want it or you want me to talk about this? Um, I'll take it. Uh, I am not a huge, so here's my concern. John, you're gonna need to go look at your school board policy and what you have on file with the Department of Ed about teacher evaluation. Uh, most of you have policies that say something like uh, a full instructional period involves 20 minutes in the elementary classroom or one period in the high school classroom uh, some of you have policies that say uh, a teacher addressing one concept with students. So my fear about just observing on Zoom is uh, whether or not that's going to be compliant with your policy, number one. My second fear about just observing with Zoom, and I kind of feel like I'm the crazy person in the wilderness screaming repent because the end is near, but just calling what you're doing over digital uh, media, just calling that education has enormous special ed implications special ed implications that I'm not sure, I'm afraid that by calling it education, we are writing checks that the district can't cash. And so uh, by doing a Zoom evaluation, you're sort of conceding that it, whatever we're doing digitally is intended to be a complete replacement for what you were gonna do in person. And I don't think any public school in this state is saying that. So those are the reasons, John, why I'm a little bit leery about calling a Zoom lesson a full evaluation. Now, having said that, if Bancroft Rosalie or any of you are doing like full instructional periods, like the kid logs on to Zoom at eight and they have a full day of instruction until 3.15 on Zoom, uh, give us a call because I might be more open to accepting that as an evaluation for a full instructional period. I'm also not opposed to you all providing feedback to your teachers and observing what they're doing on Zoom to say, hey, you could do this part better or that part better. I think that's just good administration but I don't know if I wanna put my weight legally on calling that an evaluation under the statute and under rule 10. Um, guys, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? I'd probably go even a little stronger. The statute says it has to be a classroom observation. I think you've got a tough argument if you're gonna to try to say this was a classroom observation. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about that as well. Um, Kirk asked if this FICRA leave was salary and benefits are just salaries. Um, you would continue the employee's benefits during the FIFIC relief and then just pay their two-thirds salary. Uh, the one thing that I haven't seen in the guidance, and Cody, maybe you've seen it someplace that I've missed, uh, under regular FMLA leave, if the employee doesn't come back, they have to reimburse you for their um, benefits. Is there any discussion of that for the FIFIC relief? Yeah, if the, if the employee has an obligation to contribute towards their benefits, that obligation continues just like it would under the FMLA. And the district's not obligated to advance that, flip the bill on that. So um, you, can, you can collect that as you go along, just like you normally would. But if somebody doesn't come back to us after their FIFIC relief, can we recapture their uh, benefits costs? So you're entitled to take it as, they, as, they, as those months go on, right? So if you have elected to finance that as a district, the, the guidance doesn't address that. I don't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to claw that back um, other than you're maybe trying to get a, a, you know, blood out of a rock. Yeah. Okay. Um, this question has come up a bunch. I think Shane Alexander was the first one to ask it. 
Uh, can you take the thick relief if your grandchild's school is closed? Who wants to hop on that one? I can do that one. Awesome. Go, Bobby. Um, so this is where the intersection of this new law and the other definitions of the FMLA come together. Uh, by using the words son or daughter under the age of 18, they have by definition or by co-opting the existing definition made it so that I am caring for my, my grandson or my granddaughter is not sufficient unless I am the capital P parent for that person. If I am actually the one caring for my grandson or granddaughter, like the parent, if I'm in legal control of the child, then I may be eligible, right? So if it's while mom and dad are at work, I'm watching, that does not count. If it is mom and dad, right, were, were killed in a horrific car accident, and now I, grandma, am stepping in, then you may be able to take leave for this because you're standing in actual, uh, in loco parentis, right? You're standing in uh, for that parent. Awesome. Um, uh, Chip K asked about taking out retirement and taxes. And although Chip, we don't have a for sure answer at this point in time, I think your safest bet is to withhold those things um, because I think that's gonna put everybody in the best position. And if we're wrong, we can reimburse that um, later. Um, and the system is gonna have to reimburse and make us whole if we pay to retirement. Um, Kendall Stephenson, Stephenson, I think this was one of your slides, Cody. Does the fourth bullet point indicate that any employee with a school-aged child can access 80 hours of paid leave? Uh, yeah, Kendall, that's the fifth bullet point. Uh, what I would say is no. Uh, if they have a school-aged child that's home because that school or daycare is closed, and the presence of that child at home means that the employee is unable to work or telework, then yes, they can get up to 80 hours of leave. Um, from a documentation standpoint, the government has set that threshold pretty low. So I think from a practical standpoint, if they can come in and say, yep, Johnny's home from kindergarten and I can't work, I think they're home. Uh, but no, just having a school-aged child in and of itself doesn't, uh, doesn't get them there. Uh, Chad Denker asked a, a good question too earlier, I think it was Chad, uh, about what if both mom and dad are employees of the school district? Uh, I think from a practical standpoint, you can say it's an either or, right? That if, that if mom's home working, uh, then dad can uh, take care of the kids or vice versa. Again, the federal guidance does give up, flesh out a lot about what is unable. You know, if it's, if it's a one bedroom studio apartment and the kids are all over the place, then maybe both parents can't work. Uh, and that probably gets into a little bit of the weeds on each individual circumstance. Um, but, but yeah, I think it's a fair question. If you know mom and dad are home uh, and they have one kid and it seems reasonable to you to that one of them uh, can take care of the, of the child, I, I don't know that you want to pry or die on that hill, but I th I, for me, I think it's a per perfectly reasonable question to ask him to, to at least answer that. Chad, I think that is a no-win proposition just from a practical perspective, because if you're asking the, uh, the, the, the husband um, can't the wife watch the kids while you work? And it's going to be, why are you such a bigot? Why do you assume that mom's going to watch the kids? And if you ask uh, mom, if dad can watch the kids while mom works, it's going to be, don't you know anything about how this really works? He can't watch these kids. So no matter what you do, you're going to be presumed to like be an unfeeling jerk and uh, some sort of misogynist. I just, good luck on that is my, my, my sort of uh, bitter attorney uh, jaded perspective on it. The, the one thing I'd add though is that the special rules about that limit the number of weeks that uh, married employees can take for purposes of maternity leave don't apply here, right? So we'll see what the federal regulations say. Maybe they don't say you can have 12 plus 12, but it may be that, you know, if you let mom take the first 12 weeks, then dad gets to take the next 12 weeks. We'll see. Um, next question, uh, our school is paying our employees working or not working with the agreement they can be called in to do other things at any time. Does this COVID pay affect us? Um, Bobby, I think this is something that you addressed. So you talk to that first and then I'm going to add something at the end. Yes, it does apply because that's the exact hypothetical was I'm willing to work. I just can't because I need to care for my child uh, because I have no care because daycare and school is closed. So even if I've signed a return to work agreement, I can still ask for this FIFICRA leave, 
uh, because I am telling you that I'm unable to fulfill the terms of that work agreement. So yes, even somebody who's getting 100% pay while they aren't doing anything because there's nothing for you to have them do right now has still made a promise to you that they're able to work. So by coming in and asking for this leave, they've told you, I cannot fulfill that promise. Now, they may not be eligible, right? Once you actually talk through it with them, there may be misconceptions, and I'm assuming there will be plenty of those about what this actually does. I've had employees mistake this for unemployment already, right? So this is just going to be a huge staff sort of counseling through lift that you all are going to have to, to do. But the answer is yes, they can still, even if they've signed an agreement, come in and ask for this leave. One of the reasons being specifically because they can't fulfill the promise to work for one of the qualifying reasons that are for FICRA. So I'm just going to hop in here and say that the actual terms of your return to work agreement matter a lot. Um, it, our standard agreement that we pushed out to a bunch of schools um, says that you're basically on call. And if the employer calls you to come into work, you have to come into work. But it does not say that you as the employer have to call everybody, right? So if, if you, because the, the one overwhelming thing I've gotten from administrators over and over again is we don't want to lose these people. We want to pay them so that when we reopen school, I'm not finding six new special ed paras who know how to diaper and get bit and do all the amazing things that, that paras do. And if, if what your goal is, is to keep your para educators or your classified staff on that return to work agreement, you can choose not to call them into work, even if you know they couldn't come in if you called them, if you see what I'm saying. And we, in order to get around any of the constitutional issues, we padded in a whole bunch of other reasons why we were paying them. We're paying them to be on call. We're paying them to promise to come back to work for us. Um, we're paying them because they're uniquely trained and skilled to, to perform the services that we're going to need when school reopens. So it's not just that they can work if you call them, although that's part of it. We've larded in this other stuff into those agreements so that if you want to keep your classified staff on full pay and on call, you don't have to call them in if you don't want to. And I'll, I'll let the guys kick in anything else that want, they wanna add after I say that. Okay, um, Brad's question we answered as we went. Um, grandparent, yeah, Steph, it only, you only get grandparent leave for this if, if you are raising the kiddo as the, you know, grandma's raising the kid because mom's passed away or in rehab or whatever. Um, Shane Alexander, if we're already paying them full pay, does any of this matter? I think we answered that. Um, anybody want to add anything on that? Okay. Uh, I'm going to, April's question, I think we're going to want, um, I don't know who wants to answer this. If we have a para who's currently not working and we are only paying those who show up, so the para is not working, she's not showing up, she has not yet filed for unemployment, can he or she file for EFMLA and get their two thirds pay? I think the question, part of the question, Karen, is did they sign a return to work agreement? In other words, if you call them to tomorrow and say you will be here tomorrow, what choice do they have? Because if they've not signed a return to work agreement and can tell you no, then I think they're eligible for this leave, right? Either way. Well, I think if they signed a return to work agreement, you know for sure they're eligible to take this if they, what they wanna do is not work but get only two thirds of their pay. Steve, would this para be one that got sent home because there is no work and we could say he or she is not entitled to anything? That is very possible. That's, yeah, I mean, if, if she's gone home and is saying she can't work and that was before April 1st, that's a very real possibility. I think again, the question is, are you expecting them to work? Yeah. And I think, the FICRA substitutes for when you're expecting them to work, right? It's just like the FMLA. If I, if she called in and said, I'm having a baby tomorrow, I want to take FML, I want to take maternity leave. That's not for any other reasons other than if you could have otherwise called me into work, that's when it applies. Well, and part of the issue with the closures is it's the employer sending the employee home, not the employee choosing to stay home. So that, that would be a reason the closure rules would not apply. Uh, and, and as you're seeing in this, the, the problem is we're mixing and matching and people are crossing all these lines. Um, and, and frankly, in, in most of our schools, when it says the school is closed and we sent them home, that hasn't happened in most, if not all of the schools, because we're staying open in some fashion and allowing people to work. So it really depends if you've sent that 
person home? And if, if the answer is no, I don't think the closure rules are going to apply. But, but, but April, if you've sent them home, if you're not paying them anything, if they're not expected to work and they're effectively laid off, and let's just add it to clean it up, and you're, you're, you're not paying any more of the employer's contribution to benefits, then they're not eligible for, for FICRA leave. And the, the remedy that they have, at least as this is all designed, is to claim unemployment. Yeah, Bobby. last thing I'll add in here, April, because we're this this is going to happen a lot under Q and A section twenty nine uh, of the, the the Cody linked them, and we'll of course post them when we post this webinar again. But it clearly says, "May I collect unemployment for time which I receive leave under for FICRA?" No, straight up, because the reason is you're only able to collect unemployment if you're not being given work, and the only reason you can take for FICRA is to not work if you're being given work. So I, I'm not saying it's exactly an on-off switch, but that's how the federal government is conceptualizing it. If they're sitting there eligible for unemployment because you're not giving them work, I think the answer is that they're not eligible for FICRA leave. So the, the question is, where did you leave the relationship with that employee? Are you expecting to be able to call them tomorrow or did you tell them we don't have work for you? And, and just to complicate things even more, um, when the FAQs and when we talk about unemployment, that's federal unemployment, which is different than the executive order that the governor passed last week, which relaxed the traditional standard for when somebody's considered unemployed, so as to provide a more generous benefit to people that their work is closed and maybe they're still getting benefits. And even though you expect them to return to work, which would normally disqualify them from having unemployment benefits, here they may get them. So that, that doesn't answer everything. It's just to highlight that we may be talking about two different things when we talked about eligibility for unemployment, depending on if it's federal or state law. So for those of you that checked out because the goddamn lawyers are talking in circles again, here's the bottom line. A lot of it's going to depend on what you want to do. Um, I think I, I can construct multiple scenarios where we either pay or don't pay this para. We either allow her to get FMLA or we kind of make it so she can't get FMLA. And this is why it's gonna be worthwhile for you to call us so that you can say, we want to pay her uh, for FICRA leave. How do we make that happen? Because I think we can do that. Or it's like, you know what? She was a terrible employee. We don't wanna pay her for FICRA. I think we also probably can get you there. Um, what you want is gonna matter a lot to how we analyze this. So sorry guys, this is, every, everything we're saying is absolutely right on the law, even though I know it sounds to you like we're talking in circles. Um, because that's how the law's written. Um, <clears throat> okay, Bill McAllister has a question on maternity leave. Teachers that are on maternity leave and are asking to come back to work, yeah, because they're not stupid, uh, as they're not required to come into school, are we setting ourselves up for issues later on? Cody, you want that one. Yeah, so we've gotten this question and we've answered it. He here's what I would say. Um, typically, if an employee is out on FMLA leave, um, it's their choice when they end that leave, and that's especially true. Uh, during what, what we call informally as maternity leave. As you know, uh, employees can take FMLA leave for a serious health condition to themselves or if they're caring for somebody that has that. But also there's a special provision for um, bonding time to both the mother and the father for following the uh, birth, even a healthy birth of either a child or an adopted or foster child, right? And so oftentimes informally at some point, you know, on day two, right after the mother gave birth, she's probably out for a serious health condition. And at some point in 12 weeks, that becomes bonding time by the time that they come back. The one thing I would say is that if you have somebody that uh, has a baby today and on Thursday morning says that they wanna come back because they're not expected to work anyway, I think it's fair that you ask for a fitness to report uh, or fitness for duty certification from a doctor or a healthcare provider. If, if, if you ask the same question of all people that are out for their serious health condition. So the person that has arthroscopic surgery on their knee and comes back in five days instead of three weeks, if you ask for the same type of certification there, I think it's reasonable to ask for that from the mother that gave birth within the last week. Um, if you don't do that, I would be leery of asking for such uh, certifications because it could be uh, considered discrimination on the basis of pregnancy, which means on the basis of sex. So. Um, if they say they want to end their FMLA leave, they can, but then they need to be able to perform all the duties you're asking them, them online enrichment, chat sessions, all that. They don't get to say, I don't, I'm not doing the 5 p.m. chat session with parents because that's breastfeeding time. If they've said, I can answer the bell. Yep, I think that's right. Anybody else want to add to that? 
Mark Norvell says the name Mark is really only associated with very good people. Mark, only people that haven't decided to retire are allowed to be good people. Uh, Grizzle wants to know if he's eligible. He's asking for a friend. I answered that later. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. Jane Davis says my 21 year old acts like he's 17. Uh, my 20 year old just came downstairs after rolling out of bed, Jane, so I'm feeling your pain. Um, yeah, Bobby uh, answered Grizzle by saying that he's not eligible because he's been on Fox News. Um, uh, Brian, is there a form that the DOL will provide staff to use to apply for ESL or EFL, FLSA? We assume so. We don't know when they would provide that form or if that form will be in time for you to use tomorrow. And like we said before, Brian, we will have something KSB generated if the department doesn't generate something in time for tomorrow morning go time. Uh, Short-term unemployment question. Should we apply for uh, employee groups not working. We pay paras 50% of their normal hours, but they are not working. They signed a work agreement. What reason should we use in the unemployment for subs applying? Who wants this one? I will take a shot at it. I'm pretty sure subs are eligible to the extent that they've blown the doors open and are basically just checking yes for every person that applies. So I, I don't know if you're talking about like a group aggregate application type of thing, but each of those subs, listen, even if you're going to check no, each of those subs would be foolish not to ask for unemployment right now because yeah. they have the same amount of staff and thousands more applications. And so in my conversations with schools, they just keep hearing over and over again that before we even had time to get into the details on whether they're eligible, they got their first paycheck or their first unemployment check. So if I was those subs, I'd absolutely apply. Um, and I think they're probably going to get paid. Uh, what we don't know about subs and paras and other people that traditionally fall under the school rule in the unemployment laws that says, but you don't get it over the summer because you're not expected to be working. I don't know how they're going to handle that this year. But if I was a sub, I'd apply. I would be a little bit leery about having the school apply for large groups like all your paras or all your subs because um, – uh, that 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 decision is going to have consequences for the employee that will have consequences for retirement it'll have consequences for benefits and i think each employee should be making that decision for him or herself about whether to apply for unemployment and they uh, only modified some rules with the executive order so right. all the other group employer rules may still be in place the aggregate employee group stuff so i i wouldn't touch it for that reason too uh, next question. When we closed school, we already had a teacher on maternity leave. She ran out of sick leave March 18th, and we had agreed to dock her pay as she remained on sick leave. How might this affect us docking her pay after April 1st? I don't think it will because I, the Q&A said whatever leave you had started before you became eligible for this will continue on, right? Not like question number 47. Say the question again real quick, Karen. Uh, employee was on maternity leave, ran out of sick leave on March 18th. They were going to dock her for the remaining uh, FMLA maternity leave. I think they can do that. And I think to the extent that she does what Bill McAllister was talking about, which is, okay, never mind, I'm coming back, does Zoom lessons for a day, and then says, now I want for FICRA leave, I think they can do that too. Yes, I think that's right. I'm going to, we're going to move on, and I'm going to see if I can find, I think there's a, a specific Q&A on something like that. Uh, Chris Picorni, we're planning on placing the employee rights poster where we have all of our other posters. Yep, that's right. But I was reading we need to email it to all staff. Nope, don't have to, as well as post it on our website. Don't have to, but you can. I was told posting it in school is enough. Yep, please tell me where I really need to post this. Where, wherever your uh, other posters are. And the funny thing is, and one of the things that they released, there was a, uh, the Department of Labor said, some employers are telling us that they don't have room for another poster, but that doesn't matter, find room anyway. So you have to literally go tack it up in your empty break room or buy the copy machine that no one is using right now, that's where you're supposed to post it. Anyone else want that? Good. Chris, I, I would just say that uh, I think from a pure conservative legal standpoint, I would just post the poster and not announce it. And I would, I would refer employees to the federal guidance, even though it's hard to navigate. That way the district's not represent, making representations as what the law is. 
But we, we have also, for some clients, provided a summary that they can send to their staff uh, that is kind of just a pare down, quick and dirty version of what the law is. So if you're feeling like you need or want to communicate with staff other than the poster, let us know and we can help you with that. Teachers are required to come to school one day a week and due to illness or health concerns, ask not to come in. Do we ask them to use PTO, emergency sick leave, or treat it uh, like they are due to, treat it like we are due to 79.8,106? So if we're making teachers come in one day a week, can we dock their pay if, or take something out of their leave bank if they can't come in because they're sick? Yeah, Cody. I would, I would say yes, if it was me. I mean, if you're expecting them to have duties, uh, whether that's an hour a day or an online chat session or whatever, and they can't do it, I think they need to use accrued leave for that. And if they don't have leave used up, I think they need to use the doc day provisions. And if they can't do that, I think they have to take this leave. That, that's aggressive, but I think if they're electing to not perform the duties, then you treat their salary the same way as you would have before the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is the, the, the predictability piece is also why you're not required, as Steve talked about, to provide intermittent leave. So if they say, no, no, I know, boss, I just want to take that new federal stuff on Fridays, that is intermittent leave, right? That is by definition intermittent leave that you don't have to agree to. Um, <laughs> I just got a text. My only concern today is the KSB Golf Classic. Bobby, that's a burning question. Do you want to answer I'm that now? You guys, I've lost sleep over it. Like, it's, it's not cool that they canceled the Masters on me already. Like, I'm, I'm highly irritable. Uh, but if, they, if we can't do the golf tournament, I, I, might, I might just quit. <laughs> well, we'll have that golf tournament one way or the other, I hope. <laughs> um, okay, <clears throat> we're not paying our classified employees if they're not working. We've offered work to all classified employees. So basically, if you want work, you can get it. We are paying their insurance. If they apply for unemployment uh, and get paid, does that mean they're no longer an employee and we stop paying their insurance? So basically, if they won't work and they apply for unemployment, do we cancel their insurance? Go, Bobby. The, the short answer is yes, I believe you can. Because what they're doing you, if you were having school today and they said, eh, I think I'm just gonna, gonna file for unemployment, we treat that as a resignation. The expansion of unemployment benefits at the state level has made it so that they are entitled to them, even if they wouldn't normally be when you're doing things like continuing their benefits and even some of their pay. So if they told you, I'm not going to come in and work, even though you've made it available to me, your choices are to check them ineligible for unemployment or to let them take it, but also then stop paying for their insurance premiums. This is not a a la carte buffet where I get a pick from yes. the DOL here and the school here and FICRA here. This is not how that works. And so the short answer is, if they're not working, they're not entitled to pay or benefits, which is why in our return to work agreements, we had a benefits section, which is separate from the pay section, because I think a lot of employees are just done of this misconception that you'll continue uh, their, their benefits, even if you're not paying them. Yep. And if they file for unemployment, they're saying to you, right, formally, I'm not going to come work if you ask me to, which then would deprive them of their benefits if you elect to do so. Yep, I agree. Um, Darren, Max, uh, you have asked the existential question that I have been mulling over. What does it mean school is closed? Isn't every school closed at this time? Uh, I believe that it's important. I, I know, I, I, I love Matt Bloomstead. I think he's done a nice job through all of this crisis. But I think we would be nuts if we said something like, school is still open. We've just moved to an online format because that has a whole bunch of weird special education implications. Um, and your teachers probably don't wanna say school is open because then they're not entitled to their full salary under uh, the state pandemic statute. So I think school is closed um, and whatever you're doing to supplement uh, learning while school is closed is enrichment or online education or something, something like that. Um, but I think, I think we should keep saying out loud that school is closed because if it's, if you can have school be open without having the bricks and mortar location open, I think that has weird legal implications. Um, and I would, I would add to that, certainly for, for FICRA purposes, schools close when the kids aren't there. That's the easy part. The more difficult part is under our state statutes, uh, under uh, 798106, where it says teachers get paid when school is closed. That's the one we've gone round and round and round about, about what the hell does closed mean? How are you closed when they're reporting? How are you closed when they're doing this online Zoom stuff? Um, and, and so it gets a little, 
that that could be a law school question uh, as it relates to the the state statute. But for for FICRA purposes, it's I think it's pretty straightforward. If if the kids are home and they can't go to school, it's closed. Uh, next question: What if an employee has decided not to sign the return to work agreement? Uh, who wants that? So this is pretty much what we talked about the last time. I think it was maybe April's question about. We told them we'd have work. We asked them to sign this return to work agreement to be paid during times when they're working or not working during this closure. Um, if they've elected not to sign it, what they've told you is, I'm not agreeing to be available to be called into work. So I think what they may have done, if the, the most aggressive and frankly legally best answer is, then their loan remedy at this point is unemployment. Because they're not eligible for FICRA, because you're not, you're not gonna call them in and they're not eligible for pay under your return to work agreement because they didn't sign it. They're not fulfilling the promise of being available to you. They're signaling to you, I'm unwilling to work. Therefore, I think you say, well, that's fine. Then your choice is unemployment. You're going to have to pay us back for all the benefit costs we normally pick up too. That's right. And I'm not trying to sign, sound mean about it, but the fact of the matter is, you, like I said, you can't pick and choose. Um, and I don't begrudge them trying to do what's best for them, but I think a lot of the decisions they're making are because they don't really have, you know, the, the best information to make them, and that's tough for everybody. Ron Beacon. Brad, Brad said, hold on real quick, I think unless they have kids and use FMLA, right? Brad, my, I don't think that's true because they signaled to you they were unwilling to work. The only way this emergency FMLA leave kicks in is if they want to take it to excuse their obligation to work. Yeah, and I think that distinguishes from the very next question. So the, the question Bobby just answered is, there were return to work agreements and somebody refused to sign it. Next one, uh, Ron Beacom, we did not have return to work agreements. We offered work and classified staff chose to take it or lead it, leave it. Had a para say, I have to watch my kids, it would be a wash for me to work, it will cost me as much or more than what you'll pay me. Can that para now come in tomorrow and ask for EFMLA? because they haven't taken the work offered due to the need to watch their kids? I believe the answer is, do you, or are you expecting them to work? Because this gets into the Steve territory of what, is, what does it mean if you sent them home, no pay, no bet, no, right, during this time. If you've sent them home and you're not expecting that they're gonna be able to work, then the answer is I don't think they're eligible. But if you sent them home, made work available and they said, gosh, boss, I'd love to come in, but for my kids, the question is gonna be the timing of that relative to the timing of April 1st. Yeah, that's just what I was gonna say is that, you know, this employee may get whipsawed by the effective date, but on March 18th, if you said you can work or if not, you're not gonna be employed anymore. And they said, sorry, I can't afford to work, right? And so as of today, March 31st, they're not an employee that's expected to perform services. Yeah, this new leave's created tomorrow, but you're not expecting to work Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because they've already said, I'm not an employee, you know, that, that can perform these duties. So, you know, if the timing was retroactive or the effective date was earlier, the answer might be different. But if they have stopped being an employee and stopped performing duties on a regular basis because of whatever the circumstances were, then they're not eligible for FFCRA leave. Yeah, I think it's unemployment for them. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, next question, is an employee eligible for EFMLA if the employee has an underlying health condition and is advised by a physician to stay home? The employee no. is a para that is currently reporting to the building for work. Not EF, Steve, Steve's got yeah, it. No, no, you can't get the EFMLA. Now, you might be eligible for the paid sick leave and probably are, I think, under their kind of catch-all provision. There's one provision in there. It's kind of, what the heck does this mean? Uh, I think it's that one. Uh, and, and so I think they would get the emergency pay or the uh, paid sick leave, but not the EFMLA. Yep. I think, I think they if the doctor weeks. tells them to stay home until May 15th tomorrow, I think they get two weeks, but I think that's it. Unless they've got other leave that you have given them like sick or PTO. And now, the more interesting, they, they may be eligible for regular FMLA, uh, but not paid FMLA. And I've kind of researched that a little bit. Steve's right. The answer isn't clear, except for I don't think they have a serious health condition by definition if they're trying to avoid getting coronavirus, right? So if I'm diabetic, therefore my boss or my doctor says I need to stay home for, for six weeks, I have diabetes. That could be a serious health condition, but I don't think avoiding coronavirus because of diabetes is a serious health condition, if that makes sense. So I don't know that I don't know how we're going to answer the question of I want to take regular FMLA 
after the two weeks of emergency paid sick, but that, that very well could happen. Uh, if an employee comes in with questions about his or her options, would not the wise course of action be to review the circumstances with the school attorney before a layman gives an opinion as to pay leave options? We should let Jordan take that one. <laughs> <laughs> Do I, are we serious? Yes. He's, no, I was just kidding. The, 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 lawyer, the lawyers are going to say yes, call us. But, but well, that, I mean, I think in, I think all sincerity, I think that is true. This is complicated enough. I'm a little bit nervous though about us. I, I'm nervous about you paying us to give legal advice to one of your employees. I think we can advise you as the employer. So Tom, if you call and say, you know, this employee came in and she's asking about this or that, my first question is going to be, what do you want? the answer to be. If the employee calls his or her own lawyer, they're going to answer differently based on what the employee wants the answer to be. So yes, you should call us because we, if you want to know what your real options are in any given situation, we can only tell you based on the facts as you give them to us. But if the employee is saying, I want you to tell me what I should do, the answer is you should figure that out for yourself because I don't want you guys to get blamed if this employee loses a retirement benefit because you advise taking the Victor leave. But call us. Um, <laughs> if an employee, let's say a classified staff member comes in on the third and says that they couldn't work from the 1st of April on the third. So this is somebody that's gonna apply on Friday and they wanna retroact. Can they apply for the first even though they applied late? Were you expecting them to work and did they not come in? I think we got a, a somewhat of a retroactive designation question here. I, but that I, would I think they probably can retroactively designate, don't you, Bobby? I do. That assumes they were eligible on the first and second. Yes. Yes, that's right. Cody? No, nothing to add. Okay. Uh, EFMLA can't start until April 1st, correct? So what leave can they use before that? whatever leave they're eligible for. <laughs> and, and truly, I mean, I'm not being a smart ass, but if, if you've got PTO, that's easy. They can use that for, for anything. Um, but if, you know, if you have sick leave, what do you allow sick leave to be used for? Uh, and, and so they may or may not be able to use sick leave depending on what their circumstances were. So it, it really comes down to what, what issues were they dealing with and what kind of leave do you offer? Uh, Kevin Mills, yes, we have the form ready. We will email that to you today. Anybody else that wants that, we didn't get you evaluated form. Like I say, we haven't been pushing it out because we, we wanted you to deal with this crisis first and not overwhelm you with all the other stuff. Uh, did you answer the question about the teacher out on maternity leave before we close? Amy, I think the answer is if she says, hey boss, I'm ready to come back to work and she can do whatever you're asking your staff to do uh, while we're closed for COVID-19, I think she can come off maternity leave and go on to uh, pandemic pay as long as she's able to do the work you're asking of her. Uh, I've got Mike Moody's question nailed. Uh, if so, Mike, yes, I, I think you and I both have the coronavirus. Um, so yeah, the, the whiskey consumption is, is definitely up. So you guys were the carriers. <laughs> Uh, okay, last day of school was March 16th. We had a long-term sub for a teacher who's on maternity leave. The long-term sub wants to be paid until April 3rd. The teacher decided to come back on March 25th because all she had to do was packets. Does the sub get paid until April 3rd or March 25th? I think I know the answer. What is, I want to see what everybody else says. You first. March 25th. There's no, we didn't, we didn't have any need for a sub. Once the teacher came back, we didn't have a need for a sub. I wouldn't pay the sub after the 25th. I wouldn't pay the sub after March 16th, but that's just me. Well, was the sub making packets, but you're right, Steve. You're exactly right. And is that it's sub pay or some different pay, but yes, yeah. The sub's remedy is unemployment. Todd Porter, can a bus driver who has not been driving since the shutdown be eligible for either type of this leave? They are paid when they run a route, not otherwise. This is Steve, right? It, it depends whether, yeah, are, are, are we closed? Did we send them home? Did we stop paying them because we don't have any work? I, I think that is going to be a closure prior to 
uh, April 1st. That's what it sure sounds like to me. So no, they're not going to be eligible for these leaves and, and it would be up to uh, unemployment to take care of them. Karen, did the question say, but are they doing them what driving now? They are not doing anything now. Okay. On the other hand, if they're under a return to work agreement for being available, and if you want them to help drive meals around town so that you don't have people coming into the building and they're expected to work or at least be on call, they may be, right? It has right. to do with the expectation of performing duties. But Todd, if you sent them home on whatever, March 10th and said, come back when school starts, I don't think they're eligible for the thick relief now. Also, it looks like Shane Alexander is gonna pay them a premium to <laughs> come work in Bloomfield. <laughs> So be careful. <laughs> Brad Hazing, we're allowing paras to work in the building. I have a para that said her husband works during the day. We're offering them work during the evening. Uh, can they take leave if we offer those options to our staff like the teachers? Anyone? So whether or not they're unable to work um, depends on the, the flexibility you may offer them depends on if they can telework for home, thus making them able to work, right? But that's gonna require their agreement with you on it. So if you say you can work early in the morning or late at night, take this flexibility, and they agree with you, then by definition, they're not quote unquote unable to work. And so they're not eligible for this type of leave. But again, that requires their agreement. Yeah, I don't think we can force her to come paint at night if she says she doesn't want to. Um, next question, 12 weeks or the conclusion of school, what is the end of our para contracts? I, if the, is the question about how long can they take the, this FICRA leave? I think they're asking, I think Brad is asking, if I was not going to have a para job after May 15th, can I stay on paid for FICRA leave, uh, through, oh my God, my husband just walked in the house with donuts. Sorry. Uh, uh, can we, <laughs> don't shake your head at me, Bobby Truey. Uh, can the para get paid in the summer for FIFIC relief? That's the question, I believe. I think they can't, just like you can't burn their FMLA leave for a maternity in the summer. I think, again, FIFICRA is excusal of otherwise expected to perform their work time. Yep. Just like the FMLA is. So that is the uh, next three questions, I think. It's all the same thing. When does, can paras get FIFIC relief over the summer? I think you should look at your calendar is the, is the real answer. When were they going to stop and are you going to add more days onto the end? And you may not know that right now. Chad Dinker, they're scared to come to work because they're scared of COVID-19. They have not signed a return to work agreement and they've used all their PTO. I think they out. The only, if it, Chad, if there is an expectation that they come work and they're telling you the reason I can't is because I'm scared, I think they're SOL. If they tell you the reason I can't is because my doctor says I need to quarantine, I think they may have cracked the door back open, right? I'm not going to say what Karen calls doctors, but basically if a call to your doctor who says, ooh, yeah, you did have high blood pressure three years ago, you probably shouldn't come into work. You probably shouldn't report to work. You should quarantine. They may have gotten themselves into the FIFICRA door by calling their doctor and asking for a favor. And I'm not, I mean, I, again, if their doctor's willing to sign that note, as most doctors are, the question is going to be whether they've been ordered into a quarantine. If the doctor says, well, it's a bad idea for you to work, I think they're ineligible because they're not incapable of working for any of the FIFICRA reasons. But that's, I've gotten that question a lot. That's the one thing we don't know, is when the doctor just says you need to stay home because you're susceptible. Can employees apply for unemployment if they've been cut to half of their working hours? Yeah, I, I, think, I think they can, based on what the Department of Labor has said and what the governor's executive order actually says. Those two, but the, the, the face of the executive order does not answer it perfectly. But basically, if for some coronavirus-related reason your hours are eliminated or reduced, even the or reduced portion is, the way they're processing it, probably still eligible for some uh, unemployment. Now, again... You need to think of the 
and first consequences of all mm -hmm. this stuff. Because if you're paying them 50%, that probably doesn't count for creditable service. That's right. And if they go fill up their bank account, if they go fill up their paycheck with unemployment, that definitely doesn't count. That's right. Group, uh, Rita, your group application was for pairs on short-term unemployment. Yeah, wow. the only thing I'm worried about about doing a group application, just exactly the point Bobby was making at the tail end of the previous answer, that has implications for retirement and for other things. So yes, you could do that. Make sure that they understand that that's going to have other implications. But uh, sorry about your vacation, Shane. I, I was going to go see the Eagles in April performing concert for my 30th wedding anniversary, so I'm pissed too. Uh, form, evaluator form. So yeah, okay, Bobby told them. Can't find bus drivers. Legally in regular unemployment, can they apply for, oh yeah, okay, we got it. Um, any other questions that we haven't answered, now is your chance to ask. We've lost, we had like a little bit north of 300 and we're down to 125, so I think people are wanting to get on with their lives. Um, we will uh, post this web webinar on the website. Uh, we will post slides on the website. If we have forms from the feds, we'll push those out. If the feds don't do forms, KSP will create forms and we will push those out to KSP clients that want them. Uh, I'm a little bit leery about pushing out a form to somebody that's not a KSP client because your lawyer may want you to use the forms that they put on. Uh, Larry Ann, you're such a gunner. Yes, you get an A++ because you get extra credit for sticking around. <laughs> um, I think that's it, everybody. Uh, let us know if you have helpful suggestions for how we can make these uh, new version of webinars better. Uh, we're always open to hearing that. Um, in the meantime, thanks, everybody. Keep stay low. Oh, yes, Bobby. Karen, yeah, real quick, a bunch of people put it in the comments you send, send us the we didn't get you evaluated form. My recommendation is to either email all of us, KSB at KSB School Law, or email Sherry. And she's Sherry, S-H-A-R-I at kspschoollaw.com. She's probably tracked those because Sherry's wonderful, but Sherry's awesome. for those yeah. who have messaged privately to us or in the chat, if you want that form, go there. Okay. Uh, all right. Thanks, everybody. Stay warm or stay healthy. Bye.